On average, there are 2.4 doctors per thousand people. This is the fifth lowest indicator among OECD countries. These are the data for Japan. The OECD is an organization for economic cooperation and development consisting of 38 member countries. Its goal is to contribute to the development of the global economy by achieving economic, labor and living standards. But perhaps these are not the worst numbers. In Tanzania, in East Africa, there are only 0.06 doctors per thousand people. And what if there is such a place, compared to which even the indicator in Tanzania is very good? What kind of doctor should be in a place like this? The young man, out of breath, went into an institution called Izakaya Netsuya. He apologized and said that he was late, wiping sweat from his face. The young man, holding a mug in his hand, greeted the latecomer. The latecomer's name was Amami. He asked why he was late at the outpatient clinic. A guy with glasses sitting next to me said it was a good job. Amami said the three of them hadn't had a drink since he became a resident. The young man with the beer mug said it was because he was always busy. He added that he needed to rest properly. Amami, throwing his hands behind his head and sitting comfortably on a chair, replied to Okusawa, a young man with a glass in his hand, that he was resting, for example, right now. Okusawa asked if he called the weekend, the time after the shift. The guy with glasses, completing the question, asked what kind of overtime he had today. But at that moment, Amami and Okusawa turned to the guy with glasses and Okusawa asked what Yamajishi wanted to tell them. Yamajishi asked timidly, shall I tell you? Slightly lowering his eyes downwards, Yamajishi said that they were expecting a baby. His interlocutors, not believing their ears, loudly asked, what? With joy in their eyes, they said that he would finally become a father. The young people congratulated Yamajishi, to which he also timidly thanked them. Okusawa hugged Yamajishi and said that it should be celebrated. There are only three of them, but they will have a lot of fun. Yamajishi, stopping a joyful friend, said that no, it's not just that. He, trying to stop his friend, who was happy with the news, said that Amami also had news. Amami asked if they were celebrating his departure. Okusawa abruptly asked him what he was talking about. Amami, holding the chopsticks in his hand, twitched, and asked again, what, did he say something wrong? Yamajishi apologized to Amami, to which he asked why he was apologizing. He's just being transferred. Okusawa asked in surprise when he was being transferred. Amami is sent to a clinic on the remote island of Sewajima, as they do not have their own doctor. He leaves tomorrow. The young people asked again that he was going to the island and tomorrow. Amami replied that he did. Amami added that the people living there need someone to take care of them. The guys looked at Amami in disbelief. Okusawa said he was a really weird guy and asked what about his career here at the clinic. Amami asked the quarry again and at the same time his phone rang. Amami apologized and said that he had a call from the clinic, he would answer. After the story on the other end of the wire, Amami answered the phone to urgently prepare four units of MAR. One unit of MAR is 140 milliliters of erythrocyte suspension obtained from 200 milliliters of donated blood, taking into account the addition of 46 milliliters of preservative solution. He said he would be there soon and asked me to get ready to stop the bleeding. The guys asked what happened. Amami replied that it looked like a patient who had come to them with cirrhosis of the liver had started bleeding and that a varicose vein might rupture. Rupture of the varicose veins of the esophagus is a condition in which increased venous pressure in the portal vein causes the veins of the esophagus and the submucosa of the stomach to swell and rupture. Why is there massive bleeding? He will have to leave for a while because this is his patient. Amami congratulated Yamajishi once again. Amami left the establishment and began to hail a taxi. The complexities of hospital policy. No, in fact, they wanted to transfer him. Okusawa said it was just like him. He pointed out that Amami came to Izakaya, a traditional Japanese drinking establishment, but did not even touch the drink. Yamajishi said it looked like Amami didn't drink. Okusawa, objecting, said that no, he was not averse to drinking before. Yamajishi agreed, saying that apparently not this time. The doctors surrounding the patient looked at the monitor, watching the indicators. They said that if anything happened to the patient, Amami would not forgive himself. One of the doctors said, damn, there was a hero here too. He is always thinking about the welfare of others. At that moment, Amami, putting on a medical suit, entered the operating room. Standing in front of the patient, he indicated to proceed with endoscopic hemostasis and prepare for EVL. Endoscopic ligation of esophageal varicose veins is a minimally invasive operation in which the varicose veins of the esophagus are ligated with special flexible latex rings. As a result, the blood flow stops, which leads to further sclerosis. This patient received the results of genetic tests. Amami, showing an X-ray, said that there was a mutation in the RNA gene. 
Diagnosis Hypophosphatemic rickets Hypophosphatemic rickets is a disease characterized by hypophosphatemia, impaired absorption of calcium in the intestine and rickets resistant to vitamin D therapy or osteomalacia. It is usually inherited. Symptoms include bone pain, fractures, and growth disorders. A girl and a little girl were sitting in front of a mommy's office. They asked him if it could be something serious. The doctor happily replied that no, it seemed that the medicine had had an effect and they could be calm. They thanked the doctor. Conversations can be heard outside the walls of the office. Someone asked if a mommy was on night duty again. The answer was that yes, after the bleeding stopped. The girl, leaning on the table, said that it was the last patient today. Next to her, the girl who was collecting documents from the table said that he wanted to be responsible for his patients until the last minute. However, without Dr. Amami, they would not have known the cause of permanent fractures. The girl sitting opposite Dr. Amami, smiling, thanked him, calling him uncle. To which the girl sitting next to her addressed the girl as Nanochka and said that this was a doctor, not an uncle. Nanochka and Amami smiled at each other. The girls standing outside the office continued to communicate. One of them said that Amami wanted to stay at the university and that he was such a good person. Another girl replied that it was true, but good people usually don't stay at the university. Dr. Amami, finishing the appointment and seeing off his patients, told them with a smile on his face that they were his last today. He asked the patients not to forget to take their medicine and asked them to take care of themselves. The sweet girl, calling Amami uncle again, said goodbye to the doctor. Reflecting, Amami thought that a village without a doctor is like a one-way ticket. No career advancement. The girls who helped Amami during the operation continued to work. One of them, holding a stack of boxes in her hands, asked the other to help her. To which the other girl, apologizing, hurried to do it. At some point, they heard the voice of Dr. Amami and turned to him. He apologized if he had caused them any trouble and also thanked them for their help. The girls shyly replied that no, it wasn't and thanked the doctor in return. Amami told the girls that he hoped he would come back here sometime and asked them to take care of themselves. The action begins to take place on the civilian ship Ozawa. Amami, leaning his head over the side, was clearly feeling unwell. A man standing nearby shouted at him to clear himself, just not on deck. He asked, shouting, what was happening to him. He's a doctor. The man asked Amami what about motion sickness medications. Amami thinks he just took it, but it doesn't look like it had any effect. The man abruptly interrupted Amami and shouted at him that he couldn't hear what he was mumbling. Are all doctors such weaklings? Well, it can't be helped. The sea is really raging today, he added. It was very bad weather outside. Amami, walking along the pier, was relieved to say that they had finally arrived. A man in a black raincoat was shouting after him as he caught up with Amami. He shouted he curious him. Entering some room, Amami asked the man in the black raincoat in surprise, What is this, a storeroom? But the man continued to speak in his own dialect. Kawashu Jutsu Sukaya Naitsuka Cheta Tajia. Debuhito Ga Hatterin Dizata Dekanari Sama. After these words, he apologized. But he continued to speak Netakova Nasemashida. Amami stood in a stupor. He didn't understand their dialect at all. Amami spoke decisively to the man, apologized for starting like that right away. But he had heard that their village did not have its own doctor. He added that if any of them need help, then don't be shy and come to him right away. The man Amami was addressing looked at each other. The man in the black cloak continued to speak, Gaskimparagata Omo, Dr. Dizayadin Amava Skimpa Oren. Amami frowned, because he doesn't understand anything. He began to get very nervous and was already sweating. He turned back to the men and apologized. He said he had just arrived and did not understand them at all, and they even went out to meet him. Amami said he would try to understand their dialect by the time he started seeing the first patients. The men continued to stare at Amami with bewilderment in their eyes. Suddenly, they came up to Amami and started thanking him. The man in the black raincoat said that the whole island was grateful to him for deigning to come there. Another man added, telling Amami not to worry about the black cloaked elder's strong accent. He said it was nice to meet him. The elder said that they say that there are such villages all over the vast country without a doctor, and they are so lucky that he is here, Isasa. He also said that the weather there is as bad as on other islands. Amami was greatly perplexed. There are up to 600 villages in Japan without doctors, which are not easy to replenish even after contacting the central government. Amami said he would try to remember the words too. He was answered with a light laugh that the main thing was that he did not overdo it. The men, heading towards the exit, said they would leave Amami and look in on him tomorrow when the storm stops. Amami finally shouted that he hoped they would get along and warned that if they felt unwell, they should immediately go to him. 
It's bad weather outside, it's raining heavily. Amami lay down to rest on the bed, he was tired after the journey. Lying on the bed, he began to drink water from a bottle. He said he would learn the local dialect first. Looking at the water bottle, he decided to cool it. There was some noise in the fridge. He creaked out of bed and suddenly, a bright light appeared and everything around him changed. A chariot pulled by three creatures was moving along the road. Behind the chariot on a chain were girls who were having a hard time walking. Suddenly, the man sitting on the carriage shouted to the man sitting with the carriage to stop the carriage. He asked what was the matter, using the name Anda. One of the girls, connected by chains to the others, fell to her knees and bent down to the ground. Anda got off the carriage and roughly hit the girl and shouted at her to walk properly. A shout was heard from the carriage, Crane. He thought, what happened? The king was sitting in the frame of the carriage window, holding a pipe in his mouth. The man looked through the carriage window and asked the king what was the matter. The king asked him why he was bothering with her. He told me to just kill her, because she's a bad product. They can neither sell it nor let it go. Anda, with surprise and fear in his eyes, asked the king if it was really necessary to do this, because they had just got her. The king did not say a word, only looked at Anda with eyes full of madness. Anda said that he understood the gentleman and, leading the girl away from the carriage deep into the tall grass, said that it was impossible to allow the others to get dirty in her blood. He asked them to wait for a while. The girl was lying on the grass with tears in her eyes and looking at the man. Anda, pointing a gun at her, said that he was very sorry, but she could only curse her own weakness and lack of luck. Suddenly, behind the man holding the girl's chain, a terrifying creature in the body of a lion with horns and wings appeared. Anda was scared out of his mind and turned back. The creature began to growl at the man with all its anger, and he began to run away, shouting that they were mocking him. It was a chimera. We need to leave soon. The girl, with fear in her eyes, continued to sit on the grass with her hands tied, while the chimera approached her. The girl began to be dragged up. Suddenly, Amami found himself in the thicket of the forest with his two bags. He got up from the ground, a stick stuck in his hair. He scratched his head thoughtfully, put the stick away, picked up his bags and looked around. And then, shouting, he apologized and asked if anyone was here. Strange sounds were heard from the ground. Amami got scared and looked down at the ground. There he saw a strange slug with a hollow stump on its head drinking his sports drink. Amami was very surprised and started pinching himself to make it hurt. He realized that there was pain, at least the sensitive innervation was normal. Looking at the slug, he thought, because from the point of view of medicine, this is not a dream, but reality. He began to look at the slug in surprise and wondered, for example, what kind of life form is this? After all, he looks like a slug from some RPG game. Does he wonder how his body works? He also noticed that he had drunk a sports drink and wondered if he was okay. Amami took the bottle in his hands and at the same moment the slug rose and stretched out its short legs to the bottle. He asked if he wanted to drink and offered to take a bottle. He put the bottle back so the slug could drink. Squatting down and looking around, Amami said that it didn't look like Sewajima at all, and in general, this place was like. Suddenly, the same girl with a chain around her neck and her hands tied fell on him from the sky. The slug twitched. Amami shouted in surprise, what is it? He noticed that the girl had unusual ears. But more importantly, she's breathing strangely. Amami began to examine the girl and at that moment she began to shout incomprehensible words right in his face. She was trying to convey something to him, but again he couldn't understand anything. Amami apologized to the girl and said that he did not understand her, but he would like to examine her. Suddenly, the slug abruptly jumped off the ground and spread right across Amami's face. He was trying to figure out what was going on and immediately heard a staccato, run. It was the girl who shouted at Amami to run away. He guessed that he was beginning to understand her and asked if he should run away from what, from whom. And then, suddenly, a huge chimera began to emerge from behind a mighty tree. He picked up the girl and said that now it became clear to him who he had to run away from. The chimera was approaching and had already bared its fangs. But Amami rushed to run away from the creature as fast as he could when it started to catch up with him. Amami ran as fast as he could, but he couldn't stay on his feet and fell. Amami covered the girl with his hand and began to think what they should do. At this time, a chimera was slowly approaching them. Amami began to slowly drag the girl along the ground dragging her into the bushes. He realized that there was only one thing left, and at that moment he took out a diagnostic medical flashlight. He asked the girl to stay there and not make any noise. Amami jumped out of the forest and began to attract the attention of the chimera by waving a medical flashlight. The chimera got mad at him and squeezed her eyes with anger. Without taking his eyes off the young man, he began to move towards him. 
A girl was watching everything that was happening from behind the bushes. The guy continued to wave a medical flashlight, which finally angered the chimera and she began to attack him. As soon as Amami swung the flashlight towards the chimera, a slug appeared and an incomprehensible liquid suddenly flashed out of its hollow log standing on its head. The chimera stopped in surprise, began to stare at the eruption with bulging eyes, and the slug continued to spray liquid out of itself. Amami realized that his slug was asleep and thanked him for it. He said that the slug was simply amazing and thanks to its power, he began to understand the girl's speech. The guy headed towards the girl lying on the grass. He asked if she was okay and said it looked like they were saved. Looking at the girl, he realized that her whole body was covered with spots. He said it was a rash and he knew about it. The girl, continuing to lie in the grass, said that it was an allergy. The mommy began to examine the girl. He found that she had shortness of breath and impaired consciousness. On examination, he noticed that the radial artery was not palpable. The pulsation of the radial artery is not palpable with a systolic blood pressure of less than 80 mmHg. In general, if blood pressure is unknown in a normal state, systolic pressure of less than 90 mmHg is considered a state of shock. He realized that it was anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is especially dangerous if it is accompanied by a drop in blood pressure and loss of consciousness, which can lead to death if immediate help is not provided. He had definitely encountered similar symptoms in the old world. Continuing his examination, he saw that her leg was injured. He realized that the blood loss was not great, but he needs to deal with his allergies first. Taking his bag, he took out an ampoule of adrenaline. An auto-injector with adrenaline is an adjunct for temporary relief of anaphylaxis symptoms and prevention of shock before receiving medical care. Looking at the girl, he apologized to her in advance, warning her that she would be in a little pain. The next second, he put an adrenaline shot in her leg, which caused the girl to scream in pain. Unknown people appeared on the horizon. They saw a mommy sitting on the grass and said it was a man. The guy, looking at the unknown people, asked who they were. He was answered that they were residents of a village located not far from here. The shortest of them said with a surprised face that this girl was his granddaughter. He asked what he was doing to her. Amami said with a confident tone that he was treating her and that he wasn't done yet. The guy asked the villagers to take them to a clean and safe place. But the resident only asked if he was treating her. To which Amami asked the residents to help them once again because the girl has not yet come to her senses. They find themselves in a village, in a building where it is clean and safe. The girl is lying on a wooden table, and a mommy is standing next to her in a medical gown. The heart rate monitor on the girl's finger shows 98%. A heart rate monitor is a device for measuring the pulse rate and saturation of arterial blood with oxygen through the skin. Seeing such indicators, a mommy was delighted, because it seems there is no need for tracheal intubation. However, he needs to be put on an IV and injected with corticosteroids. At this time, a nearby villager thought that redness of the skin and difficulty breathing were the curse of the forest god and wondered how he was going to treat her. Amami began to install an IV drip on a hook hanging on the wall. Looking at the girl and the actions of Dr. Amami, the headman said that without a doubt, he is a real magician. After all, the girl began to breathe well. Amami noticed this and said that his breathing had returned to normal and he thought that the worst was over. The IV continued to serve the medicine and in an instant the girl opened her eyes and looked at Amami. When he saw this, he happily said that she had regained consciousness and that was great. But the girl only said, man. The girl lying on the wooden table abruptly jumped off it and rushed in the other direction from Amami. The wound that was on her leg was bleeding again. She stumbled and rolled head over heels across the floor, crashing into the wall of the building. Lying on the floor, she looked at the guy in the white coat. He asked her if her leg still hurt and offered to let her help. Amami smiled at her, but the girl looked at him doubtfully. Suddenly, unexpectedly, she flew up. This slug released its liquid in a huge jet, which in turn put the girl back on the wooden table. Lying on the table, she asked Amami to take care of her. Further actions take place in the king's castle. A young man standing over the king recites spells. Here the apple tree has arranged so against poison that there will be no life in the world forever. The magical light from the crystal blinded everything around and at the same second, the wound on the king's arm magically overgrown. The king was very surprised at this miracle, and turning to the priest, told him that he had saved him. The king did not know what would happen to him when this monster appeared. In response, the priest told him that no, it was divine providence. This makes his heart overflow with happiness. The priest said it was a reward for his faith and took out gold coins. He hugged the king and added that their comrade would have survived if he had received help in time. 
He is sorry that his faith was not strong enough. Sitting in the village house, Amami said that everything was fine now, having bandaged the girl's leg. She said it didn't hurt at all. Amami said that the anesthetic had worked and the wound would heal quickly, because she was still young. The girl thanked Amami. Sitting on a wooden table, the girl asked if Amami was really a wizard. To which he replied that if he were a wizard, he wouldn't have to cut off her claws to take her pulse. Besides, with the help of magic, he could easily remove her collar. He noted that, however, he is only a general practitioner. A girl with a thoughtful face asked if it was true that anesthesia is a healing magic that only people can use. Amami, continuing the conversation with the girl, said that this is not magic and moreover, it can be used not only by people, and that even she will be able to master this science if she studies hard. The girl thought about it and said that she was a beastman slave and asked if she could master this art, to which Amami confidently said that she could and he would help her. He invited the girl to work together. Finally, the guy introduced himself to the girl. He said his name was Amami Yuido, but suggested that they just call him Yuido. He asked what the girl's name was. The girl, timidly answering, said that her name was Corona. Amami was glad to make this acquaintance. At this time, the grandfather of a young girl enters the room and addresses Amami. The doctor is happy to inform him that his granddaughter is on the mend. Grandfather, responding to Amami, says that they are saved and now if the slavers return, they will be able to return what they lost. Corona began to tremble at these words. Grandpa turned back to Amami. He said it was forbidden to steal slaves, and asked how he had managed to take his granddaughter away from them. They gave it to them in exchange for a promise not to touch the village. Only church servants are allowed to use healing magic. He also said that they would now be forced to pay exorbitant compensation, and if they said they didn't know anything about it, they wouldn't believe them. Koron, unable to contain her emotions, began shouting at her grandfather, proving that Amami was not a thief. But her grandfather immediately told her to shut up, calling her a slave. Perplexed, Amami turned to his grandfather with the question of whether he would be able to refuse help to someone who is right in front of him. The grandfather with the eyes full of madness said that magic is more expensive than human life. Villagers, holding up the tip of a spear, began shouting that Amami was the source of their problems and they had to ask him to leave their village immediately. Amami was surprised and began to prove to them that this was nonsense when suddenly, suddenly a chimera bursts into the room and growls menacingly at everyone. There is a panic in the village, everyone is shouting that this is the forest god and they are all finished, because this has never happened before. With sadness in his eyes, Grandpa Koron said that Amami had brought trouble on them. The chimera directed its gaze directly at Amami, baring its teeth. Koron, noticing that the chimera was standing still, asked Amami why he did not fit. At that moment, the guy noticed that the slug with a stump on its head was pointing straight at the evil creature. The slug with its short legs pointed precisely at the wound in the chimera's body, a stick was stuck in it. Amami realized that he was so angry about this thing that got stuck in him. Amid the panic and fear, Amami's voice was suddenly heard. He turned to the gentleman and said that he had a suggestion. He asked how about a deal. Despite the chaos that is happening, he is not going to run away, but on the contrary, he will be able to cope with this situation. But in return, he asked to leave the village with that girl. But the residents were categorical. One of them said that they would not obey any man. But Grandfather Koron decided to accept his terms, because in this case they will be able to pay compensation. But Amami has already begun to inspect the Chimera. He had already figured out where the incision could be made. Amami, Koron, and the slug that jumped on the guy's shoulder were already heading towards the Chimera along with the doctor's bag. In disbelief, the grandfather asked the guy what he was going to do. The doctor, without even turning around, said that he would remove the foreign object stuck in it. The residents of the city were very surprised by this, asking if he would dare to touch the forest god. But Amami's thoughts were completely in the problem and turned to the crown with a request to see if she could help him. To which the girl undoubtedly agreed. Amami pointed out that it was his duty as a doctor. Article 19, paragraph 1 of the Japanese Law on Medical Practitioners states that doctors engaged in diagnosis and treatment may not refuse patients' requests related to their compensation unless there is a reasonable reason for this. Taking a bag of medicines, Amami said that he does not refuse to treat someone if he turned to him, be it a criminal, God or anyone else. At the same time, he opens a bottle of saline and adds that he is a doctor. Amami begins to help the chimera. He begins to wash the wounds and at the same moment the chimera flies up from the intolerable pain. At this moment, the slug comes to the rescue, holding it, allowing the doctor to finish the procedure. Amami thanks the slug for his help and asks him to hold him like that for a little longer. The doctor quickly stabs the wound with lidocaine. 
Lidocaine is a local anesthetic and a cardiac depressant. In combination with the active ingredient lidocaine, it temporarily blocks sensory and motor nerves in the area of application. Next, he adds midazolam. Midazolam is a sedative used, for example, to calm patients, which allows you to bring the necessary treatment. After the last injection, the creature falls into a deep sleep as the midazolam has taken effect. The next moment, the doctor takes out a straight razor and begins to cut off the chimera's mane. The guy notes that the risk of infection is, of course, present and apologizes to the creature for the shaved mane, because otherwise it would be unclear where to make the incision. The doctor examines the place that he will have to work with. Amami noticed while putting medical gloves on Corona's hands that the spearhead was akin to a fishhook and couldn't be pulled out just like that. He notes that he would prefer to work in the operating room, but he does not have to choose. The doctor begins to lubricate the circumference of the wound with iodine, which is used as a local disinfectant. The doctor covers the wound area with a sterile cloth and addresses the crown. He says that there is a blade in his bag and asks to get it with forceps and attach it to the handle. This way she will get a scalpel, which she will give to the doctor. Having learned the instructions, Koron picked up surgical forceps for changing scalpel blades. Amami warned the girl to be careful, because the blade is very sharp. The doctor continued to give instructions to the girl and told her to move the blade to the left. Corona succeeded, and she handed the finished scalpel to the doctor. He turned to her and said that he would do the rest himself. Corona was surprised and asked what she should do, and the doctor wanted to ask her something. He asked Corona to wash the wounds of the residents of the city, and said that after that they would clamp the wounds with a piece of clean cloth, and he would examine them later. He added that, given everything that had happened, it was not for him to ask her for such a thing. But Corona, with a twinkle in her eyes, ran in the opposite direction, saying that she would bring water and cloth. And the doctor, in turn, proceeds to extract the foreign body, thanking the fleeing crown. Corona and his grandfather are sitting on the floor. Grandpa told the girl that they also owed their lives to the forest god. With their claws and fangs, as well as the power of the curse, because it scares away those who could harm them. The girl asked again, curses, to which her grandfather replied in the affirmative that the curse would fall on anyone who dared to touch him. Therefore, he advised the girl not to approach the forest god. At that time, Dr. Amami was working on the extraction of the chimera's foreign body. He reasoned that there was no way to get it out just like that, since the spear was stuck like a fish hook when you tried to pull it out. In the case of a fish hook, you need to push the hook, including the beard, until it comes out of the skin. Then bite off the sting of the hook along with the beard. This method is not applicable to a spear since its tip has a different shape. So, in order to pull it out, you will have to make an incision. Picking up a scalpel, he begins to cut the skin from the sides and gets to the ledge. He understands that he has done well, and he was lucky that the strength of the skin was within the normal range. The doctor continues to make the incision and looks for a protrusion under the skin. Amami finds the ledge he was looking for. He hopes that there is nothing else there besides these protrusions. Now he starts looking for a ledge on the other side. At this time, it begins to get dark outside, the moon has appeared in the sky. Villagers are trying to observe the doctor's work. They try to see how he's doing, but they can't see well from there. The village elder says that if he fails to save their god, then they will have to kill him. Even if the wizard saves him, he will still be killed by the curse. At this point, Koron resorts to the residence, bringing with him a bucket of water and a clean cloth. She offered to wash the resident's wounds and then treat them if he would allow it. At this time, Amami continues to operate on the Chimera. During the operation, Amami says that he will need stitches later because he needs to hurry. The doctor begins to pull the foreign body out of the Chimera. He grabs a piece with both hands and tries to pull it out. At this time, the creature gave signs that it might wake up. Amami was afraid of this and asked the Chimera not to get up yet. He wondered if it had been stuck while the beast was sleeping. In order to avoid making the same mistakes, Amami decided to act more carefully. He began to carefully remove the spear from the Chimera's body, blood flowed from the wound. At this time, Koron tried to help the residents in washing their wounds, but they refused, asking them to stop playing wizard. She's just a beastman slave. Koron agreed that they gave her to the slavers, but she never wanted to be a slave. Besides, she knows how hard it is to feel pain. Therefore, she once again asked to be allowed to help them. After thinking about it, the villagers agreed that since this was the wizard's instruction, they said it was better than just licking, and the hand of one of the residents did not stop bleeding at all. The villagers agreed to accept the crown's help. At this time, Amami continued to perform the operation. He finally managed to pull the spear out of the wound, but at the same moment, a fountain of blood splashed out on the doctor from the wound. 
He thought the spear had damaged an artery and reached for the gauze. The villagers, who were watching the operation process, noticed this and realized that it was blood gushing like that and it was rubbish. Amami grabs the gauze and tries to plug her wound. He understands that he needs to put his hand deeper and put pressure on the bleeding site inside the wound. The next second, the blood stopped gushing, and he exhaled. Looking at what was happening, Koron asked the guy if he was okay, but the elder told her not to interfere. The doctor selects instruments, forceps, ligature. He shouted in response to a question from the crown that everything was fine and apologized for the trouble. It became much darker outside. The moon hid behind clouds, which made it impossible to see anything at all. The guy, continuing to hold the clamped artery, realizes that if he does not stop the bleeding right now, it will be bad. At this time, large drops of blood are flowing down his arm to the ground. Amami decided to appeal to the crown. He apologized and said that he needed light, asking the girl to help him. Koron, holding a rag in her hand, stood in thought. She was ordered not to approach the forest god. But at the same time, Amami told her that even she could master this science if she studied hard. The girl turned to her grandfather and apologized to him. She said she would help him and ran to the place where the operation was taking place. The girl called out to Yuido and held out a torch in his direction. The doctor thanked her for the torch and said he would need her help. He reassured the girl, saying that the situation was under control. The girl agreed to help. Amami began issuing instructions. He said he needed a hemostatic clamp, the thing in the back. A hemostatic clamp is a surgical instrument used to remove, manipulate and capture tissue. This is the tool she used to replace the scalpel blade. With a sharp curved end, the girl held out her hand to the doctor, on which there was a hemostatic clamp and asked if it was him. Amami said that it was him and that the girl reacted quickly. The girl handed the instrument to the doctor, who in turn asked her to take the wand that was lying on the bottom right. She remembered that it was the same magic device that he had used back in the forest. Amami agreed with this and asked to shine a light inside the wound. The torch could be removed for now. The girl shone the light deep into the wound, and at that time the doctor realized that the arterial bleeding would continue as soon as he released the gauze. He clamped the artery with clamps and realized that the bleeding had stopped. Corona was delighted and said it was cool. The doctor turned to the girl and said that everything should be fine now and they could continue the operation. The girl, seeing the doctor's suit, said that he was covered in blood and asked if he was alright. He said that yes, it's not very hygienic, but he can't just stop the procedure. He said that a doctor should not abandon patients, so we need to continue. The doctor took a thread and began to sew up the artery. Stitch, the thickness of the thread is indicated by a number from 10 to 1. The thickest is 10, and the thinnest is 1. With a thickness of less than 1, zeros are added, 2 divided by 0, 3 divided by 0, etc. The larger the numerator of the fraction, the thinner the suture material. If it is assumed that the seams will not be removed, you can use a thread of this type, which can be dissolved by the natural chemical process of the body. If it is necessary for the thread to remain in the wound for a long time until complete healing, thick non-absorbable threads are used. The doctor continues to tie the knots and says that the bleeding should stop now. If the thread comes loose, the bleeding will start again. He made several more knots with a thread, thereby bandaging the vessels. After the end of this procedure, the doctor said that you can remove the clamp and you can exhale. He further said that he needed to excise the infected skin, although there was a risk of causing a closed injury. Then you need to install the Penrose tube and apply stitches. The Penrose tube is a sterile rubber tube used to drain liquids such as blood or pus. The doctor asked Koron to stay there a little longer. She agreed. After getting stitches, Amami said that he would like to observe him for a while, but this is impossible, since he cannot stay in this village. They noticed that it was already morning. Corona, with a spark in her eyes, said that Yuido had worked hard. The guy praised the girl in response and said that the forest god was also well behaved. In this case, the operation is completed. At this time, the creature opened its eyes, and the doctor plopped down on the ground from fatigue, realizing that the extraction of a foreign body was successful. Corona and Amami are busy washing rags on the river, but Corona said she could handle the laundry on her own and asked why the doctor didn't take a break. To which Yuido refused, he said that he needed to wash the blood stuck to his body. Besides, he is afraid of viruses. The operation is completed, it's time to leave. The doctor looked at the girl, asked her forgiveness and began to examine her eye. He told her that it wouldn't do and that her eyes needed to be rinsed out too. The girl objected and said that her eyes sting when water gets in. He said that getting blood in her eyes could lead to infection, she had to be patient. 
The girl agreed. During surgery, the patient's blood may get on the mucous membrane of the doctor's eyes, which can lead to infection of the doctor, for example, with the hepatitis C virus. Therefore, during surgery, the doctor is recommended to wear protective glasses to minimize the risk of infection. The girl washed her eyes and the mommy praised her for it. The young man began to dream of a bathtub, but the girl said that they are only in the homes of people of noble origin. Amami thought about it. Suddenly, the girl rushed at Yuido because she saw that he had blood left and shouted that the virus needed to be thoroughly rinsed. But he began to run away from her. In the dilapidated building, the elder and Amami were sitting on the floor. Koron was sleeping soundly next to them. The elder asked the guy what it meant that he wanted to go on a trip with Koron. Amami answered this question in the affirmative. He said that he more or less understands the situation. Did he specify that there was a possibility that those people would come back here looking for her? In the next second, the elder told her that her mother died immediately after giving birth, and her father died from wounds received during the hunt. He said it was a common thing for them. Did a mommy specify that they risk their lives in childbirth and foraging? The maternal mortality rate in Japan was 409.8 cases per 1,000 people as of 1899. Currently, thanks to the development of obstetric care, this figure has decreased to about 3.3 cases per 100,000 people. On the other hand, in the Republic of Sierra Leone, in West Africa, the maternal mortality rate is still high, about 13 cases per 100,000 people. The elder said that of course, everything would be different if the healer magicians had come there, but they are just a small village. From the very beginning, there were not enough young people in this village, and the forest god was injured. Now they are defenseless. It's only a matter of time before people attack them. Perhaps fate itself wants this girl to go to the outside world. The next moment, Koron woke up. She turned to her grandfather, but he told her that he had done everything I could for this village. He's very sorry. No one deserves to be abandoned. There will always be someone who will help them. He said that they only need to rely on their own strength. Koron turned to her grandfather and said that she would return to them one day. The elder looked at the girl in surprise. Corona said that she would help Mr. Wizard, because he saved not only her, but also the forest god, and also helped the villagers. She continued and said that then, when she had mastered this science properly, she would return to heal the sick and wounded. Grandpa continued to stare at Corona with surprised eyes. Mamami turned to the elder and said that he had no idea where they could be found. The elder began to suggest that if he went to the land of people, but Amami interrupted him and said that he was not sure that people in this world were the same as in mine, and that they would take him for one of their own. He said they would have been more suited to the place, that the crown was safe, where all races peacefully coexist with each other. He asked if the elder knew of such a place. Events unfold in the hollow of the world tree, the land of the elves. There are many elves in the great hall. The queen and the princess appeared in the archway. Among the crowd, someone said that these two were wizards sent by their people. They will diligently perform their duties. Princess Yuno said that although they can use magic, healing spells are only available to members of the human race. She asked me to take care of them. The wizard agreed, because besides, they share their religious beliefs. Lowering her tear, soaked eyes down, Queen Melina thought to herself about what other religious beliefs they were talking about. They unilaterally set high prices for access to healing magic. As a result, it is nothing more than a political tool. However, there are too many injuries and illnesses in this world that can only be cured by magic. If only they could heal themselves. In the village, meanwhile, the residents were saying goodbye to Amami and Koron. One of the villagers, addressing Amami, said that they were impressed with him, even though he was a human being. He apologized for causing him trouble, to which the guy asked them not to worry, because it's already in the past. Amami reminded the residents not to forget to do as he ordered. One of the residents asked that the wounds should be thoroughly washed, right? At this time, the elder turned to Amami, calling him a wizard. He said that if they went the same way, they would end up in the domain of the western demons. They won't meet people there, but there are many other races that get along well with each other. Amami thanked me for the information. The elder turned to his granddaughter. He asked that when they left the village, she should call Yuido her master. This is a necessary precaution, as they travel as a human and a beastman. Koron, grinning, replied that she understood him, but Amami was very confused by this. The next moment, they turned around and ran down the path, saying goodbye to the residents. Everyone was happy, except for the elder, who had tears. Moving along the path, Amami remembered that he wanted to check how the forest god was feeling, but since yesterday he has not been seen anywhere. 
It's true that he couldn't stay and watch him, but it would be unpleasant if he formed a dead space that would begin to fester. Dead space, depending on the application of the wound, an empty space may form in the area of the wound, which was not there initially. The dead space may be filled with leaking fluid or pus, which makes healing and recovery difficult due to infections or other causes. Suddenly, a forest god appears from behind a tree. Amami was greatly surprised by this meeting and joyfully ran to him, and the forest god, in turn, gently lowered his head to the ground. The guy immediately examined the stitched wound and said that it was almost healed and the fur was also growing very quickly. It became a rather curious case for him, and he would have written an article about it if he could. Amami apologized to the forest god and said that he would like to watch him until he fully recovered, but now they need to leave that place. He asked the forest god to try not to get any more injuries and take care of himself. When Amami and Korom were sent along the path, they noticed that the forest god began to move after them. Amami asked with a twinkle in his eyes if he wanted to go with them, to which the forest god bent down to the guy and began to caress. Smiling and stroking the forest god, Amami turned to the frightened Korona, who was hiding behind a tree, and asked her that he was considered a local deity. How could they take him with them? The girl, peeking out from behind a tree, said she had no idea. Continuing to stroke him, Amami said that in any case, he did not want to be attacked again by someone and suggested that he travel together. Hearing such words, the slug got angry at the guy, thinking that they were not taking him with them. Amami apologized to him and said that he was going to travel too. Suddenly, Koron fell at his feet, clutching his stomach tightly. He asked her if she was too. The girl hugged the guy tightly by the stomach. He patted her and said that then they would all go together. At least he won't be lonely in this completely unfamiliar world. Mr. Eccles is standing on the balcony, looking up. The man standing behind him asked what he wanted to talk to him about. Rather, he wanted to warn him, Carnelson. The gentleman told him that the people who live in the caves of these trees have wisdom accumulated over many years of life. He asked to remember it. If he notices an attempt to steal the spell, he must immediately stop the treatment. He went on to say that they, the people, thanks to the healing magic given only to them, got everything, prosperity of the people, universal respect, border security. Carnelson asked what would happen if the secret of their magic became known in other countries. Mr. Eccles replied that in this case their kingdom would disappear in the blink of an eye. The weak are oppressed, this is the law of nature. In the past, weak people were afraid of demi-humans, feared demons, and fled from dragons in terror. However, God took pity on them by sharing one of his own miracles, healing magic. Soon, the epidemic, a scourge for all living things, swept the whole world. The possession of healing magic allowed humans to become the most numerous race on earth. At some point, the man thought, they have healing magic. This makes them, the people, representatives of God, the rulers of this earth. God regretted what had happened, because his gift made people not only stronger, but also more arrogant. At the same time, he did not want to share his miracles with the oppressed, as it once was with people. He could not ignore the weakened, fading lives, so God decided to give them something else. The power of knowledge available to every intelligent being, which does not violate the laws of nature. And this is highly advanced medicine indistinguishable from magic. Two men came out of the tunnel and walked along the road. The girl asked Mr. Carnelson if he was sure. He addressed her by the name of Saya and said that she had seen everything for herself. Neither the mania nor the leaves had any effect. There's nothing you can do about it. Saya thought that they had come to the land of the elves to help, but in the end they abandoned everything and ran away. She told Carnelson that this would lead to a war with them. Carnelson said that even if they return to their homeland, they will be accused of fomenting conflict. And in the worst case, without finishing, Saya interrupted him and asked him what he was suggesting to go to them and confess their powerlessness if he did not want them to be killed right now. To which he asked her to stop complaining and said they needed to get out of there as soon as possible. Queen Melina sat on the throne, leaning on her arm, guarded by two guards. Suddenly, Princess Yuno started running to her with the news that something terrible had happened. The queen tried to find out from her what had happened. To which Yuno shouted that the healers had escaped. Even more drooping, the queen lowered her head. Yuno added that she is sure that they will find out about it soon. The queen looked at the princess and said that she would report to them. The girls went to them and Queen Melina started talking about how she was really sorry to report this. They had already decided that the lady was not going to explain herself about this. She realized that they already knew everything. Someone told them to let the girls in. They demand to explain how they were going to settle this. In the thicket of the forest, Amami began to remove the stitches from the healed wound of the forest god. The guy said that everything seemed to have healed and apologized to him once again that he had to shave his fur. 
He warned that it would grow back quickly. The next second, the forest god began to lick a mommy. Corona, lifting her foot on the stone, said that she didn't understand anything anyway. Amami began to explain to her that everything was simple, the speed with which he recovers is simply amazing to him. It should be noted in his medical history. Corona wondered what the medical history was. Amami said that these are records of how the disease was cured, or how it needed to be treated so that others could familiarize themselves with them. The girl was surprised and asked the guy why they were passing such important information to other people. At this time, the forest god was slowly creeping up to the girl, and suddenly he attacked the girl and with the help of his mouth was able to tear off her collar and chain. The collar clattered to the ground. Amami, giggling, said he was scared. He saw that god had taken off her collar. The snake looked at the girl with eyes full of sadness and sadness. She's kind of apologizing for that leg wound. The girl was very happy about it. She rushed to hug the forest god and thank him for his help. At that moment, the slug gave its voice. Amami asked him what he had this time, for which he grabbed him by the cheek with his little paws. Princess Yuna was running across the field from a pack of black wolves with beaks. The girl decided to accept magic for her safety, but at the same moment one of the wolves attacked her and tried to bite off the girl's head. She was surrounded. Yuno thought, a pack of black wolves, they should have appeared right now. If she didn't bring back the escaped healers, the pack was slowly approaching the girl. The next moment, the forest god suddenly jumped on them, on which Amami, Koron and the slug were sitting. Amami, sitting astride god, said that it was dangerous and that the wound was still bleeding. The princess slowly began to open her eyes and suddenly realized that the forest god, the beastman and the man were standing in front of her. She bent down in front of them and flew into Amami at full speed. He shouted that he had caught her. Running up to them, Koron asked what they would do. Amami immediately realized that the cure was of course. First you need to give it a horizontal position. The doctor began to lay the girl on the ground. At this time, the slug also plopped down on the ground, offering himself as a pillow under his head. Amami and Koron sat down together next to the princess. Amami said that we need to start with the most serious injury. It is necessary to do a rinse, but will the solution be enough? The doctor opened the bottle and began to wash the wound on the princess's head. He took a gauze and applied it to the wound. He looked at the gauze and gasped. There was a slight bleeding on the gauze. Perhaps it was worth using xylocaine with epinephrine. The combination of epinephrine, which has a vasoconstrictive effect, with the local anesthetic xylocaine is used to stop bleeding. The mommy turned to the crowd and she immediately handed him the medicine box. She asked if he needed it, to which he replied in the affirmative. The doctor took a syringe and inserted it into the medicine bottle. After filling the syringe with the drug, he slowly injected infiltration anesthesia, which is injected not through the skin, but directly into the wound. The doctor slowly took the syringe out of the wound and applied gauze to it. After waiting a bit, he lifts the gauze from the wound and realizes that the bleeding has stopped. Next, he took out a skin stapler, which is used to stitch superficial wounds. A stapler will save a lot of time, but its use is prohibited if bones, nerves, blood vessels or internal organs are located within 5 mm under the skin. And the guy began to staple the princess's wounds with a stapler with careful movements. Corona was surprised and said that the stapler was cool, because it closed the wound so quickly. To which Amami said that the wound was clean and not deep. He finished stapling the wound and noticed that the supply of medicines was running out. He didn't know what to do. Princess Yuno, lying with her head on the slug, opened her eyes and gasped. She immediately jumped up and turned around in fear at the slug. Immediately, her attention shifted to the forest god. She would still be surprised to see him with her own eyes. Corona joyfully shouted that the princess had woken up. But the girl just continued to be surprised and did not understand anything. Yuno realized that she had a sore head wound, which was treated by a doctor. At the same moment, the crown shouted to the princess not to touch the wound with her hands, but with uncertainty asked if she was speaking correctly to the doctor. Amami scratched his head and said that yes, he had treated the wound, but it would not heal so quickly. Princess Yuno noticed that the blood really wasn't flowing anymore. The doctor said he sewed up her wound. There will be a scar, but he thinks it can be covered with hair. He apologized for that. Yuno noticed that she had so much blood, and she thought that this man was sorting it out. The princess asked the doctor, is he also a healer magician? Amami was trying to find some words, but at the same moment, Corona shouted that the princess was wrong. This is not just a man in front of her. This is her master, the most outstanding mog healer among all people. Amami, embarrassed, said that they had not yet met other magicians to claim such a thing. Looking into the princess's eyes, he said that, however, he would do everything in his power to help those who needed her. 
the princess does not need to ask the church for help because the forest god himself brought them to them. To which the forest god turned questioningly. The girl, sitting on her knees, began to ask for help from a magician healer, to which the guy timidly replied well. Yuno said she understood how rude her request would seem to him, but her country at all costs. And then the girl understood what the doctor had said. She asked again about what he had just said. Amami, with a slight smile on his face, said he was ready to help her and asked where he needed to go. In surprise, the girl began to cry. Wiping away her tears, she said that she needed to go to her country. She would like him to help patients with bleeding. Did the doctor ask what they were bleeding about? Corona said that there was pain in her stomach and blood was expectorating. A very terrible disease. In their village, several beastmen died because of her. Princess Yuno added that in addition, the patients have black excrement and they are getting weaker every day. Amami immediately thought about it. It turns out that there is bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract and also black stools is the cause in the upper gastrointestinal tract. He realized that it would be good if he could cure them with the remaining medicines. But first they need to be examined. He invited the others to leave. Amami asked the forest god if he would mind if they all flew on him. To which the forest god shouted joyfully, expressing his agreement. Amami, Koron, Yuna and Slug sat on the forest god. The forest god accelerated with such speed that in the next second he immediately flew into the sky. At the same time, in a dark room, the guy asked his lord if the princess would really be able to return the fugitives. He answered him, holding in his hand the belt from the collar worn by the queen. That of course he could, she would be crushed to pieces. Otherwise, they will kill everyone, including the mother of that country. The queen, with tears in her eyes, only quietly said Yuno's name to herself. At that time, in a small house, Dr. Okuzawa was receiving a patient. He told the patient that he shouldn't tell him in front of him that you can get cured by just lying in bed and drinking alcohol. Grinning, the patient said that it was better not to be angry with Dr. Okuzawa. Wrinkling his eyes a little, the patient said that it would rain again soon. He asked me to take care of myself by going to the doctor. He agreed and thought about a mommy, where could he have gone? After reaching the right place, the forest god landed on a stone path leading directly to the castle. Amami, Koron, Princess Yuna, Slug and the forest god were moving towards the entrance to the castle. Corona, with admiration in her eyes, looking around, said that it was so beautiful there and asked if it was so with Amami. But the princess, lowering her eyes to the floor, said that she had something to tell them. She apologized because she did not tell them this right away, deciding that in that case they would not have deigned to come there. However, she acted unfairly, considering the kindness shown by Mr. Wizard. Koron, turning to her master, asked him what she was talking about. But he did not listen to her words, but only looked at the castle doors. But suddenly they saw that some people had come out of the castle and were heading here. The princess asked them to be careful as she had not told them about them. The queen was standing behind these people. You know, turning to Mr. Alec, said that she had brought Mr. Wizard back, as they had agreed, and asked to let her mother go. In response, she was rudely told that she was lying and called a fool, specifying that she also brought a chimera to take their souls, right? But the princess shouted without hesitation that the forest god had kindly taken them there, that's all. Alec bit his lip and said that was how he believed her, and then loudly, pointing with his finger, he shouted that they had violated their terms of the contract. With eyes full of madness, he said that they had risked their lives for them and if they did not intend to fulfill their part of the bargain, then they had no choice but to end their existence. The princess replied that it was true that their country was safer because of their strength, but the treaty was violated by them. The queen, full of sadness and sadness, softly pronounced her name Yuno. The princess continued that they allowed them to live there in exchange for services. The World Tree Kingdom had done everything in its power. However, they took her mother hostage, causing her a lot of suffering. Don't they understand how she feels about it? Yuno does not understand what the hell security is. They have no right to demand that they comply with the contract. Alec asked in disbelief to live. Isn't she ashamed to speak as if she understands everything? What kind of life is it when you get sick and can't get cured? He added that yes, they are subject to price discrimination and it is people's fault. At this time, Ali stood rooted to the spot with surprised eyes. Alec continued that it must be a lot of fun for them to watch them give the last one to pay for the services of doctors. He's willing to bet that they don't give a damn what happens to them. They have nothing left but pain and death. He will never forgive them and will repay them in kind. He will give them all a taste of pain and death, and for this he will take nothing from them. The degree heated up, Alec flared up like fire, and then it exploded abruptly, sending fire all around. The bright light from the fire blinded them. Amami asked what was going on there. 
and he heard threatening words that Alec would burn them to ashes. At the same moment, a huge black dragon appeared from a dense column of fire, which looked directly at the doctor and everyone next to him. With horror in his eyes, he stuttered and shouted that it was a dragon. At that moment, the dragon opened its mouth and shouted, offering to try to heal, addressing the man. At that moment, the dragon shot a column of fire from its mouth, but a slug came to the rescue. He heroically jumped off Amami's shoulder right under the fiery blow and was able to bounce him up. The dragon, standing in disbelief, asked what, is it water? The slug was able to protect itself from the pillar of fire of its own, and therefore they remained alive, but flooded with water slime. The slug jumped on Amami's head, and he in turn said that he would sleep it again. The next moment, angered, the forest god jumped up and jumped straight towards the black dragon. But Alec, in the guise of a dragon, told him not to underestimate him, asking why he was protecting them at all. But then Amami's words were heard. He asked me to listen to him. Amami stood with his hand in the air, drawing attention to himself. The forest god and the dragon turned to the doctor in disbelief. He confidently asked where the patient with bloody vomiting was, because he would like to examine him as soon as possible. The dragon looked at Amami questioningly. The princess started saying that Mr. Wizard, but then Amami himself started talking. He said that he provides care to all patients, whoever they are. The princess was surprised to think that this man was true, but the dragon interrupted her thoughts, saying that it was all lies, they were people. At the same moment, he was called and the dragon queen Lindworm, the dragon of madness, appeared on the road. The princess thought that she had appeared. The dragon queen turned to Alec, asking why he was trying to kill the one who came to treat her. The dragon reincarnated back into Alec and, running to the queen, asked why she, his mother, had come at all. The queen asked that he had not yet understood who he was up against. At this time, the forest god, bearing his fangs, was slowly heading towards the queen. Alec replied that the chimera couldn't handle him, and the queen replied that she had come to the campaign for a reason. The queen headed towards the friends who had come. The guests stood on the meth in horror and began to sweat. The queen walked right up to Amami and looked him right in the eye. She greeted the slug with her hand. The queen said that they had not seen each other for a long time, addressing him as an ancient one. The queen said that what happened was entirely her fault and she asked for her deepest apologies. She turned abruptly to the others and shouted for them to release Queen Melina immediately. She apologized for her children. But Alec, perplexed, asked why she was apologizing to them. But suddenly the queen felt ill. She put her hand to her mouth, from which blood began to come out. Amami understood everything at once. The queen fell to her knees and Amami rushed to her. He realized that she was the patient. He began giving instructions to his assistants. He asked Yuno to move her to a quieter place. She understood everything. Koron asked to bring his bag. She immediately started to do it. But Alec was filled with anger, and he shouted at Amami about what he was doing and not to dare touch his mother. Amami looked straight into Alec's eyes with confidence. They exchanged glances with him and Amami demanded that it happen faster. The queen was carried into the room and put on the bed. The doctor began to carry out an examination. He opened his eyes after examining the conjunctiva of the eyelids. He noticed a white color, and this is a pale conjunctival ring. Pallor of the conjunctival ring. Normally, the lower eyelid is bright red with red reticulated capillaries on the anterior edge and white on the posterior. However, with anemia, the mucous membrane of the lower eyelid may have a pale shade. Everyone watched the process in disbelief and did not understand what he was doing. Amami reasoned, he doesn't know if it can be interpreted that way, but he has a suspicion of anemia. Depending on the degree, a blood transfusion may be required. Did Corona specify a blood transfusion? The doctor said there wasn't enough blood in her body. Simply put, someone else has to share their blood with her. The princess shouted that it was the same. But Amami abruptly asked what was the matter. The queen explained that she had heard that blood transfusion had already been practiced. Patients often died in agony, so now this technique is banned. Amami began to wonder if there was an incompatibility of blood or a problem with sanitary conditions. You can't dismiss the possibility of infection, but still. With transfusion of blood of different types, the membrane of red blood cells is destroyed, and a number of adverse symptoms occur. He said he understood, it was forbidden. The princess, in hope, said that if only the leaves of the world tree had worked, they would not have found themselves in such a deplorable situation. Amami asked about the leaves of the world tree. The queen began to tell me that the leaves of the world tree have the magical property of lowering the temperature and relieving pain. It was because of them that their kingdom was founded there. Amami took the leaf of the tree that the princess had given him and began to sniff it. He asked how they used it. Antipyretic, analgesic. 
The princess said that they drink a decoction of these leaves. Amami asked what if, for example, you peel the bark off a tree and boil it. But Yuno categorically said that she did not use the bark. Amami thought it was something like quinine or aspirin. Alec intervened in the conversation. He said that if he had something to say, let him tell it. Amami reached into his bag, telling Alec one thing. He handed him a blister with pills. Alec asked what it was. Amami replied that it was aspirin. It lowers the temperature and relieves pain. This is a very good medicine. The princess emphasized that he lowers the temperature and relieves pain, goes out. Alec said that yes, it has a similar effect. Only aspirin has effects that are undesirable in this syndrome. It dilutes the blood and causes an upset stomach. In ancient times, the physician Hippocrates used the antipyretic and analgesic properties of acetylsalicylic acid contained in willow bark. This acid also had side effects, such as severe gastrointestinal disorders. It was only in 1897 that Dr. Felix Hoffman managed to synthesize acetylsalicylic acid, which was much better tolerated, although the side effects could not be completely eliminated. This is how aspirin appeared, a very important drug in modern medicine. It has antipyretic, analgesic and antiplatelet effects. On the other hand, the bark of cinchona, a plant of the matter family growing in the Andes, contains the alkaloid quinine. This plant has been used since ancient times as an antipyretic, and then used as an ingredient in various medicinal tonics for the prevention of malaria. Koron noticed that the drug dilutes the blood and causes stomach upset. It turns out that the treatment had the opposite effect. Amami agreed, saying that it is possible that these leaves helped them earlier, but now it is better to refuse to take this decoction, given that it can have the opposite effect. Alec asked if it was true. The doctor said that yes, it's true, but he still has no evidence that they really have the same effect. You can't say that this is the case without making sure. Scared, Alec asked what they should do then. Amami reasoned, given the dark stools and bloody vomiting, that the cause of the bleeding was most likely in the upper gastrointestinal tract. Ideally, an endoscope is needed. The queen's children misunderstood and asked if it was some kind of spell. Koron joined them and asked what an endoscope was. Amami said that this is a device that allows you to look inside the body. If you know how to handle it, you can not only detect the place of bleeding, but also prevent it. The princess admitted that this is the first time she has heard of such a device. The dragon queen joined the conversation. She turned to the man, saying that it was not surprising that the ancient one followed him everywhere. She asked, isn't he a marabito? Amami did not understand what the queen was talking about and, turning his head, asked how it should be understood. The queen turned to Alec. He asked what it was. Lying on the bed, she uttered the words that it looked like her days were numbered. She hadn't prepared a speech for the occasion, but since there was nothing she could do, she would accept the fate that was in store for her. Alec, not wanting to listen to such words, shouted mom. But the queen continued. She said that she also apologizes to all the inhabitants of the elven kingdom. Tears rolled down the queen's face. Alec leaned over to the queen and sat on her lap. Koron turned to her master and asked, is there nothing that can be done? Amami began to think. He realized that there was not enough vonoprazine left. He was not sure if it would be enough for treatment. Vonoprazin, when swallowing food, the secretion of gastric juice is stimulated, which promotes digestion. However, sometimes gastric acid damages the stomach and esophagus, causing reflex esophagitis or stomach ulcer. He can't perform a laparotomy blindly, let alone without tools. Amami stood thoughtfully for a while, and then realized, Eureka. But this time, Alec, holding his mother's hand, bowed down in front of her. Amami shouted out, it seems he knows how to save her. Let the patient give up, but Amami Yuido does not give up. Alec, screaming, said, a way to save his mother. And I asked Amami if it was true. The doctor agreed, but said he needed to check something first. This wound is on my arm. Interrupting Amami, Alec asked, is it a wound? The guy continued and asked that he had just received her in the form of a dragon, right? Alec chuckled and said that it was, and so what? Reasoning Amami said that the queen is his mother, it can work. But Alec doesn't understand anything and finally asked to explain, turning to the man. The doctor explained to Alec that after seeing his wound manifest in human form, he understood how his mother could be saved. If it is a large dragon, then he will be able to carry out treatment even without an endoscope. The queen joined the dialogue and asked the doctor what he meant. Amami said yes, he would get into the upper gastrointestinal tract to stop the bleeding. He will penetrate her body after she takes the form of a dragon. However, he will need several things to be treated with this method. He said he was counting on their help. But Alec was adamant. He disagreed with the doctor and said it wouldn't do. The queen tried to tell him something. But Alec, turning to his mother, said that people could not be trusted. 
this despicable one decided that he could do whatever he wanted inside his mother. It is clear that this is not possible. Amami said that if his words that he would treat her did not inspire confidence in him, then he suggested that he do this, he would closely monitor his actions. If Alec decides that he has tricked him, then he can do whatever he wants, and Amami can do whatever he wants. It's coming, Amami added. Alec said that these were very impertinent words and asked if he was serious. Isn't he afraid? Amami said he was afraid. He is afraid that the patient may die because of his inaction. Alec looked at the doctor. At this time, the queen closed her eyes. The next moment, they hurried down the long staircase. Amami, tired, said what a long staircase. Koron, encouraging him, said that it was only a little bit to the observation deck. The observation deck was huge. Amami, seeing the queen and her son in the distance, waved to them. He asked that they just need a sight of similar size. The princess agreed. The other sons brought a rope and offered to use it. Amami thanked them and said that he was just right. Alec came up to him. Did Amami ask him that he came empty-handed? He asked for a bigger blade, and he told him then that there would be a blade. At that moment, Alec came close to Amami and bared his teeth, saying, Look carefully. The next moment, he stuck his hand into his own horn. Amami was surprised and scared. Next, he pulled out his hand and spit on a strip of blood that appeared on the ground. At that moment, a sword was formed from it. Amami asked in surprise, is it a katana? Alec, lifting the sword with his foot, handed it to the doctor, saying that this sword was made from his blood with added magical power and offered to use it. There was a bleeding wound on Alec's arm. Amami agreed to use it. Amami said that he needed to treat his hand, but they stopped him and told him not to be stupid. At that time, his arm was already being bandaged. Perplexed, the doctor asked what magic power was. He was told that it was the transformed power of mana in the atmosphere. Magical power cannot be described in general terms, since its use varies depending on the magician and his race. The queen added that it seems that he pours magical energy into the resin, which he constantly chews. Amami continued to stare at the queen with big eyes. He pondered, a mysterious force. Even if he asked for more details, they would surely tell him about things that go beyond his imagination. He has no other choice right now. He took the sword and opened its case. But at the same moment, he burst into a bright flame, and Amami screamed loudly in fright. The princess said that he is a fire dragon, and it seems that the power of fire is sealed in him. However, an ordinary blade would be more useful to him right now, right? But Amami liked it, and he said it was cool. He closed the sword case. He replied to the princess that no, perhaps this sword would be better than usual. He said he was ready. Alec nodded to his mother, and at the same moment she began to turn into a dragon. Everything around flared up and flooded with bright light. And now a dragon of enormous size appeared in front of them, occupying almost the entire arena. Everyone looked at this transformation with admiration. Koron said it was amazing. In amazement, Amami, without taking his eyes off the dragon, began to approach him. He said the dragon was even bigger than he had imagined. It's just an incredible life form. Koron timidly called Amami, Master. Alec glared after him. Amami began preparing for the procedure. He saw that Koron had taken the rope and asked if she was alright, was the rope heavy? But Corona, having calmed the doctor, said that everything was fine. She asked to be allowed to help him at least with that. Loudly shouted the name of the Dragon Queen, Lindworm. He asked her to turn over to the left god. She agreed and began to roll over. But at that moment, she vomited blood from her mouth. Everything around began to fill with this liquid. After examining the liquid, the doctor noticed that it was hot. He assumed it was gastric juice. He thought he had been blown away, because he thought it was easy to get inside through the mouth, but if he had fallen under the gag reflex, it would have been a complete out. The gag reflex is triggered on the back wall of the pharynx, contracting the muscles of the pharynx and causing vomiting. It is easy to trigger it by pressing two hands on the root of the tongue. One of the main causes of discomfort for patients during endoscopy. Scratching his head, Alex said he had a lot of self-control, considering how hot that thing could be. He asked why even he couldn't do anything here. The doctor apologized and said he wasn't ready to give up and asked if there was anything else he should know about them. He chuckled, saying that it annoyed him, but he would do it for his mother's sake. He said there were two things he needed to know. First of all, dragons have a glowing stone in their throats. If he touches it, he will die. Secondly, their stomachs. They instantly digest anything. He told him to beware of gastric juice, because for him it is instant death. Amami thanked him and said he would be careful. Sitting on the tail of the dragon, Koron asked where to tie the rope. 
Amami was surprised when she managed to get in there. He thanked her for her help and asked her to tie a rope next to the bow. She understood the instructions. She asked him if he was going to get in through his nose. Amami agreed. Nasal endoscopy Due to the fact that the endoscope does not pass through the throat and does not touch the base of the tongue, the probability of causing a gag reflex is minimal. Corona began to tie a rope around the dragon's scales. The box with the cable fell down. At this time, the dragon took a deep breath and exhaled hotly. Amami said that everything was fine. Koron asked, what now? Amami, already climbing into the dragon's nostril, said that he was starting to stop the bleeding in the upper gastrointestinal tract. Crawling inside the dragon, he was already drenched in sweat as it was hot there. But then he was abruptly doused with water. He turned to see what was the matter. There was a slug sitting upside down. Amami was surprised and said that he followed him. He added that it was very dangerous here and it was better for him to return. But the slug did not obey the doctor and jumped on his head. Having accepted this, the guy said that there was nothing to be done and offered to go ahead. The doctor saw a light ahead. He realized that it was that glowing stone. He remembered Alex's words about not touching him. It looked like it was dangerous to even approach him. You need to try not to touch the wall of the throat. He realized that there was only one way out, to slip into the esophagus as quickly as possible. He touched a certain part of the dragon. Suddenly, a strong evaporation began. He began to sink head over heels deeper and deeper. He was screaming very loudly from fear and uncertainty. He realized that from the very beginning it was like this. It will be the same on the way back. Amami ended up in some kind of tubular organ. It was very dark in there. Amami said it was obvious, because the light came from that stone. He took out his medical flashlight in the hope that it would not run out. The doctor turned on the flashlight, it was working. Lighting up the organ, he noticed that there were quite a lot of scars. They looked like takoyaki ulcers. Maybe she swallowed something when she was in dragon form. Takoyaki are balls of batter stuffed with boiled octopus. The guy continued his inspection. Then the stomach begins. The fact that the stomach cardia is inflamed means. He realized it was gastroesophageal reflux to a degree when compared to a human. Gastroesophageal reflux is a condition in which stomach acid is thrown into the esophagus. The doctor noticed that gastroesophageal reflux cannot lead to vomiting with blood. In reflux esophagitis, the Los Angeles classification is used, in which type B is one or more changes in the mucous membrane longer than 5 mm within the fold. Suddenly he heard something. He asked what it was coming from the mouth. Shining his flashlight, he saw something dripping. He realized that it was a peristaltic movement. Peristaltic movement is involuntary movements produced by the esophagus and other organs to push food into the stomach. As he fell, he remembered Alex's words. First of all, their stomachs instantly digest anything. He asked to be careful of gastric juice, for him it is instant death. And he fell into something unknown. There's something wrong with the rope Amami was holding. What happens in the dragon's body? Alec walked up to the rope and realized that something had happened. He tried to pull the rope, wondering if the person was okay. At this time, Amami tried to grab the rope, but nothing worked for him. He saw a slug flying with him. He realized that now he had to grab hold of it and extended his hand to it. The slug, by extending its small arms, can reach the guy. And this helped them escape the slug held on to the rope, and Amami held on to the slug. They were already happy, but at some point their hands separated. Amami began to fly straight into the gastric juice. He understood that he couldn't go there. If only he could get to the wall. But at that very moment the slug helped Amami again. He stretched out his paws as best he could and reached the flying guy. It would seem that Amami is about to fall straight into the gastric juice. The guy was already covered in sweat from fear. But the slug was able to save the doctor once again. I fell on the walls of my stomach and realized that it was starting to hiss. He realized that it was dangerous. It's good that he's wearing ordinary clothes. If his movements were constrained, he would already be dead. Here he abruptly remembers his savior. She begins to actively examine him and ask how he is if he was injured. The guy realized that the slug was fine. He told the slug that in any case, they were saved thanks to him. He allowed himself to say it again. He called him amazing, but he admitted that he himself had made a mistake. The guy lifted the slug up and thanked him again. In response to this, the slug pinched his cheek. He thought that besides, constantly calling him, you like that. He remembered that Lindworm called him ancient. Amami said that ancient in English would be elder. 
and she suggested the slug's name Ed. He, in turn, instantly became cheerful and began to jump in all directions. He realized that he liked the name. Amami suggested moving on. Holding the rope above, Alec realized that the rope began to twitch. He tested once again and asked how long he should wait there and worry. During gastrointestinal endoscopy, air is introduced into the gastrointestinal tract to facilitate passage of the endoscope. The disadvantages of this technique include abdominal pain, bloating, and in some cases, arterial hypotension and bradycardia. Continuing to carry out the examination, Amami wondered what the condition of the stomach was. And then he saw blood flowing down in a certain place. Amami thought that this was not stomach acid, so it would not be eaten away. But it's better not to step on it, otherwise he will slip. At that same second, a column of blood fluid rushed towards him. They quickly noticed this and took a sharp step back so that they would not be carried away by the liquid. Having managed to retreat, they watched as a stream of blood fluid flowed very quickly to the side. Amami realized that this was not gastric juice. Apparently this is blood, and relatively fresh one at that. And this means that next. And a moment later he saw a huge ball on a leg. This is Yamada type 4. Polyp. Yamada classification. Pathological formations protruding into the lumen of the stomach polyps are visually divided into four types or rather, with such an uneven surface structure. A malignant formation. Cancer. At this moment, the queen continued to lie with her eyes closed, and Alec angrily waited for the end of the operation. Two healers made their way screaming among the tall trees. The man noted what a strange place they live in. There are practically no roads here. The girl said that thanks to this they can move unnoticed. The man continued by saying that it was all their fault. Why does he even have to run around in the bushes? The girl wondered why this was so. Neither the magic of purification, nor regeneration, nor even the leaves of the world tree worked. The man said that it didn't matter anyway, but he would tell her this. When treating the disease, vomiting with blood in this case. The man had one deviation from the very beginning, due to which nothing had an effect. He said that that monster was the deviation. That's the whole point. Didn't Eccles heal sick people who were vomiting blood? After all, that's what they said, the man added. The girl thought that she shouldn't look up to this man. Eccles is an anomaly. The deviation cannot be cured in the usual way. If he can cope with this disease, then so can they. She realized that there must be some way. A moment later, black wolves appeared on the horizon. The girl loudly shouted to Mr. Cancarnelson that there was a pack of black wolves ahead. He asked the girl in bewilderment what, meanwhile, Amami continued to examine the huge polyp. He said he wasn't sure if there were parallels with humans. Vomiting blood leading to anemia. It's all because of a tumor of this size. He realized that, fortunately, the leg looked normal. He needs to perform a resection. In general, a tumor is an abnormally dividing cell mass in the body. Everyone calls such a tumor cancer when it divides in an uncontrolled manner and penetrates into surrounding organs. Amami was forming a plan of action. Typically, clamps or diathermy loops are used to wrap around the pedicle of the tumor and compress the blood flow, and then cauterization is performed with a loop or electrocautery to stop the bleeding and remove the polyp. However, he doesn't have any of these tools right now. He thought that if he cut the rope, it would be suitable as a lineature. Fortunately, the rope is strong enough. He understood that he himself remained the main pulling force, if he fails to stop the blood flow. Also, unlike an electrocogulator, a katana cannot cut and cauterize at the same time. Amami took it with him, deciding that he would need a large scalpel in case the bleeding was caused by some kind of foreign body. If it were just a stomach ulcer, the flame of this katana might have been enough to coagulate and stop the bleeding, but could he safely remove the tumor with its help? Electrosurgical unit by adjusting the electrical output settings can be used for both cutting and coagulation. Amami knew that if he didn't stop the bleeding completely, Lindworm might not be able to handle it, given his anemia. If his stomach fills with blood, he may not make it out alive. 
The guy, gritting his teeth, thought however, if this is not done now, Lindworm will eventually end up in critical condition. He doesn't know if he'll find any suitable tools if he gets out of there. Besides, he's not sure he'll be able to get there again. He knew he needed to do something now. As stomach cancer progresses, the tumor site bulges and anemia occurs due to bleeding. In addition, if the tumor grows strongly, the passage of food through the stomach may be disrupted, making it difficult to absorb nutrients. Deciding to act right away, he grabbed the rope and, running around the tumor, began to tie its leg. He thought that he needed to tie the vessels with a square knot. In any case, you need to make every effort to tighten it without tearing it. Surgical ligation refers to the method of tying and fixing a body part, including a blood vessel, using thread etc. One of the most commonly used surgical knots is the square knot. Amami made a square knot and prepared to tighten it. He began to put a lot of effort into bandaging the tumor stem as tightly as possible. He continued to put all his strength into it. But at that moment he saw that the blood was coming out, which meant that the blood flow was not blocked. He put in even more effort. All the strength he had left. The stalk of the tumor slowly succumbed to contraction of the node. The doctor noticed that the color had changed from red to purple, so there's still a little bit left. But my arms had already begun to weaken. At that very moment, Al used his stump strength to help tighten the knot tighter. The power of the tree stump intercepted the knot and began to help Amami. To prevent the slug from flying away towards the tumor, it took root on Amami's shoulders. This surprised him, and he said that it was cool that he could control this stump. Amami thanked El and offered to pull the rope together. They made every effort, and they managed to do it. The doctor noticed that the bleeding had stopped and the blood flow seemed to be successfully blocked. And then he opened the case of the sword that Alec gave him. At that same second, the sword became covered in fire and illuminated the space around. Amami pointed the blade directly at the wound to heal it. Amami noted that of course this blade cannot serve as a complete replacement for an electric scalpel, but it will probably work too. The guy began to slowly and little by little cut the stalk of the tumor. He noticed that the leg was quite soft. He tried to cut it slowly. But at that moment Alec asked angrily why is he bothering there? Corinna tried to calm him down, saying that her master would certainly save his mother. But Alec did not calm down and asked the girl on what basis she was making such a statement. If this person screws up, then she won't be happy either. The girl confidently said that she had reasons to say so. All because her owner is a great man who saved her. Continuing to doubt, Alec asked if she also had the disease of vomiting blood. He heard the answer no. Then he asked why should he believe her. At this moment, the queen said that this man also helped a complete stranger to him you know. Looking down she said that she wished his mother to overcome this illness because their friendship had known no boundaries for a long time. She said she understood why he was nervous. However, now they can only believe and wait. She recalled that his mother is now struggling with life. Alec looked down and the queen tried to console him. At that moment the dragon opened his eyes. The dragon queen thought that perhaps the operation was not a failure. During this time, Amami continued to perform the operation. He made the final cut. Now all that remains in front of him is the leg of the tumor. He thought that everything was fine, but at that moment a thick column of blood poured onto him. He realized it was blood pressure. Amami did not have time to react and a thick column of blood swept him off his feet. At that very second, he found himself completely under the flow of blood. He remembered that there was gastric juice down there. Despite everything, he held the slug tightly in his hands. At that second, those who were waiting for the end of the operation realized that something was wrong. Koron shouted to everyone to be careful. They began to run away from the dragon. But at that same second a thick column of blood gushed out of it, among which a rope could be seen. It was clear that the dragon was very ill. Alec was afraid for his mother and tried to shout to her. Examining the liquid, Koron asked what to do now. Now her owner will not be able to return. 
After touching the liquid that spread along the road, Alex said that the stones were almost not corroded, which means that, for the most part, it was blood. He also noticed that it was also cooling down. At that same second, Alec flew up. He turned into a dragon and, baring his teeth, said that her body temperature was falling. If nothing is done, she will die. Frowning, he said that he no longer intended to silently observe the man's actions. Coron realized that something was wrong and asked Alec what he was going to do. Without finishing speaking, she saw that the dragon had flown up to its mother. He opened his mouth and smoke came out. Everyone stood in bewilderment and looked at this. They shouted at him to stop, because this was not what his mother would have expected. Koron asked what kind of smoke this was. The elf queen told her that the source of dragon's life energy is mana, which they absorb from the surrounding space through the scales at the base of their necks. Having weakened, dragons lose the ability to absorb mana on their own. If she could transfer mana like fire dragons, she would do the same. However, therein lies the danger. She said that by saturating someone else with mana, the dragon stops absorbing mana itself. Having exhausted its supply, the dragon can die, as well as with heavy blood loss. But the dragon continued to saturate his mother with mana. One of the brothers shouted to him that he understood how he felt, but asked him to stop. Another supported him, shouting, that's right. After all, they won't be able to lose him too. Weakened, the dragon lowered its head. He admitted that he could not do anything alone. Having descended to the ground, he said that their mother was dying before their eyes, and he was powerless to help her. But he realized that he couldn't stop now. Those around him looked at him with sinking hearts. The dragon admitted that he had no choice but to trust the man. Looking up, he said that if Amami died, then he himself had given his life in vain. Holding back her tears, Koron asked him to stop. At this moment, Amami began to feel some changes in himself. The blood continued to flow in a strong stream, but the doctor understood that something was wrong. He guessed that Slug Al had protected him again. Amami thanked him for this. He remained unharmed even when immersed in gastric juice. Amami noticed that it looked like the defense wouldn't last long, and he needed to hurry. The guy saw that the rope was no longer there apparently it had been carried away. He realized that it was much more important now to check the stock of the polyp. Amami believes that what saved him was that the concentration of gastric juice decreased due to blood entering it. But if it weren't for the bleeding, he simply wouldn't have been thrown away. He headed towards the remaining stock of the polyp. The doctor noticed that the blood began to come out more slowly. He thought that the bleeding had slowed down a little, and perhaps his blood pressure had dropped. Amami realized that the Dragon Queen was entering a state of shock. Shock is a life-threatening condition in which blood pressure drops significantly, causing it to fail to maintain adequate blood flow to important organs and tissues throughout the body. Amami stopped and thought that if the bleeding was to be stopped, it would be now, while the blood flow was stopped. To thermally coagulate an open blood vessel, he would need a katana, but where was it? Amami found a katana, it was lying nearby. He grabbed her and said that he was continuing treatment. He outlined where he needed to go. He thought that he needed to get to the bleeding site without piercing it all the way through. The doctor flew up and tried to aim for the target. He stuck the katana right into the middle of the leg. Amami thought that now that his blood pressure had dropped, his strength had increased thanks to L. He realized that if he wasn't careful, he could be thrown back again. At that moment, the Dragon Queen opened her eyes. She began to writhe on the ground and scream in pain. Alec, in the form of a dragon, walked towards her. He shouted Mom. A picture appeared before his eyes where his mother said that her days were numbered. He could not hold back his tears. Alec shouted again Man. Blood still continued to come out of the dragon's mouth. Everyone shouted that this was the end and the gentleman's mother was running out. Koron also began to cry. At this moment, the doctor pulled out a fiery sword from the wound. He looked at the wound and was surprised to realize that the bleeding had stopped. He hopes the treatment is over at this point. At that moment, a slug jumped into his backpack. He told him that he was of course very tired. 
Amami was very grateful to him. Closing the lock on the backpack, he said that as soon as he woke up, he would give him enough to drink. After looking around, Amami realized that the flashlight was also in place that's great. Looking around, he saw that the stomach was completely smeared with blood. Some of the blood evaporated from contact with the fiery blade, which is why everything was clouded with smoke. He wants to get out of there as quickly as possible. At that same second he noticed that the rope was no longer there. What should he do? Suddenly, blood poured out on him again. In the forest, two doctors were sitting on a bench Amami and Okusawa. Okusawa asked Amami if he was at home. Amami replied that of course it happens. Okusawa asked if he was even sleeping. Amami replied that he sleeps quite a lot. But the interlocutor objected to him, saying that he falls asleep while walking. Okusawa asked to listen to Amami. He decided to dare and ask him why he was trying so hard, not sparing himself at all. Amami looked at him with surprised eyes. At this moment, the Dragon Queen was still feeling bad. But suddenly she spat out a round ball from her mouth at high speed, which fell to the ground. Everyone was scared and surprised what is this? Alec, lying on the ground in his dragon form, slowly turned back into a human. Everyone rushed towards him, shouting master. He, slowly getting to his feet, timidly asked what happened to his mother. But the dragon queen continued to lie on the ground with her eyes closed. Everyone looked at her in anticipation of a miracle. Alec tried to shout to his mother. Koron rushed towards the dragon. She realized that her master never returned. The girls were also very saddened by this. But suddenly, unexpectedly, she heard a quiet voice coronet. And at that very moment, the dragon queen's nostril began to open. A mommy began to emerge from her. Smiling, he said that he was back. Koron began to cry a lot in surprise. She rushed towards him to hug him, shouting Mr. Yuida. The princess also shouted to him Mr. Wizard. Alec, weakened, asked what happened to his mother. He also pointed to the large ball that the dragon queen spat out and asked what that thing was. Amami was surprised and said that apparently it was thrown out with him. Amami pointed out that he was the cause of the illness. Alec said what does it mean? But before she could finish speaking, Amami said that she was fine and that she could relax for now. Alec saw his mother slowly begin to open her eyes. Amami said that it's always nice to know that everyone is alive and well. Thus, the operation to stop bleeding in the upper gastrointestinal tract and remove the tumor can be considered complete. The action takes place in the kingdom of the elves. At the very top are Queen Melina and Princess Yuno. The queen told the princess that it was time to invite Amami and the rest of the guests. Amami, with a slug on her shoulder and a crown, looks forward angrily. Alec in the form of a dragon also looks at them angrily and tells them let's start. He stood up on his hind legs, rushing upward, and shouted get it. The dragon launched a pillar of fire right next to Amami and Koron. The next minute, Amami began to look for something among the fire. He said he must be here somewhere. The dragon asked him well how. Now the germs, the nasty creatures that were bothering him should be dead, right? But Amami the next second saw a broken used surgical blade lying on the ground. He told the dragon that it seemed that the scalpel had also come to an end. Amami believed that sterilization by fire was a good way, but as he thought, the flame was so strong, and he thought again. Sterilization means the destruction or removal of microorganisms from the surface of medical instruments and is usually defined as sterilization when the probability of survival of microorganisms is no more than 1 in 1 ml. Also, in addition to sterilization, there are terms arranged in order of decreasing impact on microorganisms, such as disinfection and pasteurization. Koron said that despite all his explanations, she still does not understand who these viruses, microbes and bacteria are. Alec supported her and said that he was talking about the same thing. Do organisms invisible to the eye really exist? After all, he has very good eyesight. Amami understood that it was difficult to say anything while in another world. He thinks that there may be. He himself is curious whether this is true or not. He realized that he would have to think about how to prove their existence. 
He looked sweetly at the dragon and said that in any case, thank him for his participation. Alec turned back into a human and test. Alec told Amami that there was no need to thank him since they still didn't get the desired result. Amami remembered his hand and asked him to let him know if he felt any discomfort, then he would examine it again. Alec looked at Amami with contempt and said loudly thank you, and the next second they noticed that Koron was running towards them. She called out to Mr. Tamami. The girl extended her hand to him and said that these were his clothes. She also fixed what needed to be repaired. Amami felt awkward and asked if she really did this herself. He apologized for this. Koron replied that everything was fine and that the doctor should not worry about it. She said the celebrations have already begun. The elves and dragons united again, celebrate the recovery of Lady Lindworm. She also said that they should go too. Amami, embarrassed, asked should he also go to the holiday. Alec, irritated, said of course. At least for one day he will forget about his germs. Koron told him that he shouldn't bother himself so much with his work. In that case, Amami said let's go. Quite a lot of people have already come to the celebration. Amami was very surprised. He shouted wow. The guy noticed so many different races. He said it was like he was at a Matsuri festival. He always liked the view of the world tree, under which everyone shared their joy. He couldn't believe they were here again. Koron said she was overwhelmed with happiness. Amami agreed, saying that he also had the same feelings. Suddenly, the Dragon Queen Lindworm appeared on their way. Amami asked if she was feeling well. The Dragon Queen said that yes, and it was all thanks to them. Moving even closer to Amami, she said that especially to him. Suddenly he asked to let him examine her eyes. He pulled back his lower eyelid and noticed that a reddish tint appeared. He said the color of the conjunctival ring is starting to change. The anemia appears to be gradually disappearing. Alec asked Amami how long it would take for his mother to fully recover. He replied that it was difficult to say. And frankly, he has no idea. This made Alec irritated. He asked what does this mean? Wasn't his treatment successful? Amami said that he has two reasons for saying this. First, the course of the disease in dragons may differ from that of humans as he knows them. Amami pointed his hand at the forest god eating food and said that here he is, for example. The forest god looked at the others in surprise. Early on his belly heals several times faster than that of a human. And lindworm anemia actually goes away incredibly quickly. It is quite possible that she has already. Koron interrupted him, saying that it was true that the forest god recovered in an instant. Alec asked Amami what is the other reason. He told him that the second reason was the tumor that Lindworm spat out. He said he currently doesn't have the tools to determine whether the tumor is malignant, a cancer that eats away at the body or benign. Therefore, he cannot judge the current situation. He added that this is why he cannot give an exact answer to the question of how long her recovery will take. He asked Lindworm for forgiveness. The queen asked him why he was apologizing. He didn't do anything wrong. She, of course, knows nothing about such things, but now she can only rely on the will of heaven or is she wrong. Continuing, she said that she still felt noticeably better. But it's not in her nature to just sit and wait. She asked if there was anything else she could do? Amami asked that in that case, would she mind regular examinations? With interest, Koron asked Amami what are regular examinations. He said that this is a regular inspection of the operated area. This is a check to find out if there is any problem. The Dragon Queen said inside, her dragon form. It's not hard to imagine what kind of hell a person finds himself in when he climbs there. She asked him if he was going to do it again. He said that now there is still no other way. He apologized for inconveniencing her again. The Dragon Queen was surprised and the next second she began to laugh loudly. She said he continues to generously apologize. It's so cool. She added that this man is a little strange, but at the same time so sweet. Wiping away tears of laughter, she said that she definitely liked him. She hopes that she and him will get along. The Dragon Queen said that the need for constant checkups meant that they would see each other often from now on. 
She said Yuida could just call her Lin. Amami timidly said that he was glad to meet her. Someone from the crowd, holding a wooden mug and laughing, said that the dragon liked this man. It's not something you see every day. Princess Yuno turned to see who it was. Mr. Foer Norman stood behind her. He said loudly that he greeted her highness. Smiling slyly, he asked that teaming up with a sworn enemy was there some kind of catch. Smiling, the queen said that it was up to anyone, not him, to suspect her of foul play. Hugging a mommy, the dragon queen said that this man was her benefactor. If something happens to him, she won't just leave it like that. She asked the former ruler of the dwarves to remember this well. With a wince, Norman said that she remembers the past, as expected from the ancient dragon of madness. He added that if this young man had taken even one wrong step, then the world tree could have come to an end. He clarified is he saying it right? A moment later, he hugged Amami's back and raised a wooden mug to his lips and began pouring a drink into him, with the words that he should taste the festive sake. Angry, the dragon queen said that she warned him. Norman asked what's wrong with that? He just bought him a drink. Smiling, he asked Amami how did he like it. He said it was the strongest drink in this country. He offered him another drink. Amami realized that if he refused, they would simply not understand him. Looking into the mug, he saw a rustic sake with a sharp aftertaste. The alcohol content is low, but it is the strongest local drink and he took a couple sips. Slightly intoxicated and closing his eyes, he thought that it had been a long time since he had drunk like this. The next moment, a boy ran along the road towards Norman. Norman saw him and, calling him by name Nino, asked how long he had been looking for him. The boy said that was fine. He asked what this strange company was looking at the guests. Seeing the princess among them, he fell to the ground and with pity in his eyes turned to her highness. The princess began to tell him not to worry so much. Norman agreed with this. The boy said that Master Norman should have been at least a little worried. At this time, in the dark forest, a pair of healers continued to move along their path. An angry male healer said that you couldn't imagine anything worse wolves, dragons, elves. He asked the girl to go and check if they were being chased. But the girl, bending down to the ground, turned to Mr. Colin Cornelson. She asked to use regeneration magic on her. Closing one eye, he asked was she also wounded? Well, there's nothing to be done, he'll heal her. Dripping with sweat, the girl thanked the man. He began to use regeneration magic on her. But the next second he told her to wait. The girl looked at him with confusion in her eyes. He said that he could heal her wounds, but if he was mortally wounded, she would not be able to help him, since she only possessed purification magic. With a trembling in his body, he said that his abilities were more valuable and worth saving. Besides, they don't know what might happen. The girl, with a trembling voice, said that this couldn't be the case she had already. He interrupted her by saying that she wasn't bleeding right, he asked not to exaggerate the severity of her situation. She looked at him angrily from under her brows. Looking around, the man saw a pack of black wolves. He shouted damn it. After all, they found them again. At that second, one of the black wolves attacked the man, and he fell to the ground. But the man quickly got up and rushed into the depths of the forest. The girl, who remained lying on the ground, extended her hand towards the fleeing man and shouted Mr. Carnelson. The action takes place in the kingdom of the elves. Several girls called out to Lady Yuno. She asked the others for forgiveness and said that she had to go. Coron asked what's the matter. Norman said that they will dance now. He told them to watch carefully. A moment later the girls started dancing. They danced with their feet so much that luminous rings began to be visible on the ground. Amami said in surprise that they were glowing. Norman said to watch these rings of light carefully. The girls continued to dance. Mushroom-like figures appeared along the edge of the luminous circle. Opening his mouth, Amami said that these are luminous mushrooms that grow inside the world tree. Norman said that they grow in response to the magic of the elves. He added that in other words, without the elves, the world tree would be pitch black. It was this color that brought them here, putting an end to their wanderings. 
the living space provided by the elves, who accept everyone without discriminating between them, as well as the leaves of the world tree that soothe pain these are two rare treasures of the elven kingdom. Norman said that no matter what powers someone has, he is not going to help them. They don't have to wait for help from people. After all, this country is much better than their healers. Norman added that at the same time he thinks that if they had healing magic, it would open the doors to a different future. He asked if Amami understood him. Having heard no answer, he said that it goes without saying. Norman said that he does not know what Amami will do now, but he is looking forward to his new achievements. Amami used to think he understood the importance of being a doctor. And only when he entered this world did he begin to realize the true value of this profession. Koron called out to her owner. He said that he was gradually coming to an understanding of what he should do in this world. Suddenly the clatter of footsteps was heard. There was a loud cry all around alarm. A pack of black wolves is approaching them. The girls tried to ask the out-of-breath elf what does this mean, and can he tell in more detail about what he saw. The elf said that they were people. These were magic healers who had recently escaped from them. They were attacked by black wolves in the forest. It seems that now people are running towards them, leading the entire flock behind them. With anger in his eyes, Alec asked where they were now. He said that he would not let them through death to them. He called on the dragons to go forward. The princess said that they, the elves, would fight with them. Amami, sweating with fear, timidly asked death. A pack of black wolves attack the elf kingdom. They cling to stone walls in order to somehow hold on. One of the elves said that they were climbing up here one by one. Turning to an elf named Owl, he said that they could not do without reinforcements. He needs to report everything to the Hollow, and they will detain them for now. Looking at the pack of black wolves, the healer said that because of these people they were in trouble again. He asked to quickly hide him inside. He said it was High Priest Cornelson. Amami addressed everyone present. He said that time is short, so he will try to make it shorter. He would like to ensure that, if possible, no one is killed or injured. Princess Yuno turned to Mr. Koronuido, but the elf queen called out to her. At the same time, her sword was brought to the queen. The queen thanked her for the sword and asked her to take care of herself. The princess said she was leaving. Norman wanted to turn to the gentleman, but he turned to his mother. He said that these people are not like him. It all started because of them. They are chosen beings who deserve special treatment. They really mean it. If left as is, someone else could get hurt or even killed. He turned to Amami, asking that, knowing this, he still didn't want them to get hurt. Amami replied that he understood the situation he was in and what he was talking about. And yet he cannot ignore the wounded people in front of him. He said that he provides assistance to all patients, no matter who they are. Alec got angry at these words. Alec began to have memories. He turned to his mother, looked into the hollow and asked where they were. Mom answered him they decided that they couldn't help her, and then they escaped through the window. She thinks they won't come back. The memories made him feel sick. The Dragon Queen told Yuido to do what he had to do. Turning to her son, she said that he also needed to think carefully before making decisions. Alec was upset. The next moment Amami, with a slug on his head and a crown, was already sitting on the forest god. The Dragon Queen told her son that she was going to their rescue and asked Yuido if this was true. He, doubting, said yeah. The forest god began to walk slowly, but at some point he suddenly flew up. Alec became very angry. Turning to the rest of the elves, the Dragon Queen ordered them to follow Princess Yuno and protect her properly. The queen turned to Alec again. But he flared up with anger and began to transform into a dragon. At this time, people were approaching the kingdom of the elves. The elves fought hard against the black wolves. One of the elves said that there were too many of them. A huge pack of black wolves was heading towards the kingdom. One of the elves asked the commander what should be done if this continues. The commander told him not to give up. They will remain here until reinforcements arrive. At that same moment, everything around flashed with bright light and a team of elves appeared on their road. One of the elves shouted Commander, Hayes, hike, 
the princess apologized to the other elves for the delay. And now the entire team of elves moved towards the black wolves. They fought, and the next moment Alec appeared in front of them in the guise of a dragon. And so Alec and the forest god turned against the black wolves. The other elves noticed this and said that they were saved. One of the elves turned to the commander and asked if he was okay. The commander replied that he was fine, but Hake's hand was wounded. Amami at the same moment asked to be allowed to look at the wound. There were three deep claw wounds on his arm. The gentleman asked if he could cure him. Amami said that the claws of wild animals are dirty, leaving a wound like that is dangerous. Amami said that it would be better to send the wounded man to the castle and treat him there. The gentleman asked to the castle. Scratching his head, Amami said that this was the only suitable place he knew. Hake said that he understood and would wait for him at the castle for now. The gentleman told Hayes to go with him. He agreed. Amami asked the princess if there were any other wounded. She replied that the others seemed to be fine. It's good that everything ended well. Alec, in the form of a dragon, said that no, it's not over yet. Sitting on a tree, the healer mocked a pack of black wolves. He said they were running away. Wolf spawn, but suddenly a dragon appeared behind him. Frowning, he grabbed the healer into his paws. Alec said that he told Amami that someone else might get hurt. Next time they will find a dead man. Covered in sweat, the healer began to lose consciousness. The dragon, continuing to squeeze the healer's hand, said that he still believed that it would be better to kill him here and now. The healer started screaming looking straight at the dragon fucking dragon, crap, crap, crap. Amami asked him to wait. To which the dragon simply closed his eyes. The healer looked at Amami and said that he was human. It is perfectly. He asked to quickly tell the fighter to let him go. Hearing this, the dragon squeezed the healer even tighter. The dragon extended his paw with the healer in front of him and demanded that he tell him where the other person was. But the healer only looked angrily at the dragon. Mr. Minoru said that they didn't see anyone here except him. Approaching the healer, the dragon asked that, while running away from the wolf spawn, he had abandoned her somewhere, yes. This is in the spirit of the people. He said that he would have killed him, but it would be a pity to miss the second one. He demanded to find her. And if he refuses to look or does not find it, then the dragon will kill him on the spot. Dripping with sweat, the healer thought will it be enough for him if he finds her corpse. But he has no choice, now the main thing is to gain time. We'll have to run again when we get the chance. The healer began to twitch in his hand, and the next moment the dragon took off and rushed into the depths of the forest. Amami shouted to the others to quickly run after them. He said that if they didn't hurry, Alec would kill the man. Mr. Minoru said that Her Majesty ordered him to support them. Meanwhile, the dragon flew further and further. Arriving at the place, they saw that everything around was burned. The dragon noticed that the forest god had followed him. Mr. Minoru said that everything there was burned. If he is not mistaken, this is where the young animals lived. They angered their parents. He realized that this was why they attacked them. Sitting in the dragon's hand, the healer said that this was cruel. Just before this, the healer had said that he would burn them before they attacked them. At this moment, the large tree was already surrounded by a pack of black wolves. The dragon, noticing this, rushed from the spot. A healer girl lay in the bushes nearby, shaking with chills. She lay there and made strange sounds. The dragon heard this and found her by the sounds. Lying motionless, the girl timidly shed a tear. The dragon, taking the healer by the cloak, began to drag her towards himself. Putting it in front of him, he asked Amami what was wrong with it. Looks like he's about to die. Amami rushed towards her to examine her. He lay down in front of the girl and began to watch. The doctor began to feel the pulse and noticed that the radial artery was not palpable. He also examined the girl's neck and saw that the jugular vein was swollen. He asked really? And at the same moment he unbuttoned her cloak. The doctor began to undress the girl and he saw a wound on her chest. The next second he took his medical bag and took out a stethoscope. Amami began to listen carefully to the girl lying on the ground. 
The healer in the dragon's paw thought that he was a man. What is he doing? The others watched him work. Amami heard that the breath sounds on the right side were weakened. Tension pneumothorax. He asked Koron to bring his bag. Mr. Minoru approached them and asked what he was doing. In a rage, he asked just not to tell him that he was treating her. He reminded them that Hake, who fought for them all at the risk of his life, was waiting for them in the castle. How dare he prioritize this vile troublemaker just because she belongs to their race. Amami said that this girl is in critical condition. According to the rules of triage, he must provide minimal treatment right now. The gentleman asked again triage? Triage medical triage is used to determine the priority of treatment for patients, depending on the severity of their condition. This system is resorted to when there are a large number of victims of war, natural disasters, etc., but a limited number of medical personnel and means of transportation. A special tag is attached to the patient's clothing in a visible place, and in the dark, a flashlight in one of four colors. Black, persons difficult to treat or already dead. Red, highest priority. Persons in serious condition requiring immediate assistance. Yellow, persons whose lives are not yet in danger and whose treatment can be postponed. Green, patients with minor injuries or not requiring medical attention at all. At this time, Alex squeezed the healer even tighter. The healer began shouting to Amami that he was a wizard. Then he must understand that first you need to help him. But Alec angrily told him to shut up. Amami asked what kind of injury he had. Mr. Palm Minoru realized that he was ready to postpone Hake's treatment in order to help his relative. He said that as he thought, he was the same as everyone else. That person is older and higher in position than the rest of the victims. Amami shouted that he would not live anyway. By helping Her Highness and Lady Lindworm, he was simply pursuing his own interests. In the end, it's all about status. The master angry asked that the life of a simple elven warrior was really so lowly valued. Alec tussed again. He released the healer, placing him on the ground. Amami asked to be allowed to look at the wound. A second later, the healer showed his palm to the doctor. He said that he overdid it with fire magic, and now he has a burn. He asked come on quickly, to which Amami replied it's green, a slight wound. He apologized to the healer and said that she was more important now. The healer looked questioningly at Amami. Did Mr. Minoru think about the fact that he did not treat him? But the healer loudly shouted to the doctor that he was a priest, and where did he even come from, a bastard, since he doesn't know this. Amami returned to the injured healer. The male healer continued to shout to Amami that it was a special honor to heal him, and he needed to deal with him first. But Amami has already begun treating the girl. He was trying to find a point between the second and third ribs along the midclavicular line, and he found her. Mr. Minoru turned to the wizard, saying that if the essence of triage is to assess the wounds of the victims, then early on the Haika looks the deepest and most bleeding as he believes. Why did he decide to start with a girl? But the doctor had already taken the syringe and stuck it close to the wound. The girl screamed in pain, the healer looked at it in horror. Amami left the needle in the sternum. He said that this girl had a punctured lung, so her condition was more serious than it might seem at first glance. Pneumothorax is the accumulation of air in the pleural cavity, leading to partial or complete collapse of the lung. Tension pneumothorax is the accumulation of air in the pleural cavity under pressure, compression of the lungs and a decrease in venous outflow towards the heart. Tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening pathological condition. But everyone looked questioningly at the doctor. Mommy said that this would buy him some time. Now she can be taken to the castle for further treatment. He added that he would take care of Hake as soon as he arrived on site. He apologized for making me worry. Mr. Minoru also apologized. He still doesn't understand the rules that the wizard adheres to and wonders if Hake will recover. A second later, having picked up the moment, the healer rushed from the place screaming now, those idiots. But Alec, without even turning towards the fleeing man, quickly grabbed him with his tail. Writhing in pain, he began to scream, turning to Amami a foreign wizard. He asked him to help him. 
he really doesn't know who he is. Scratching the back of his head, he replied that the only thing he knew was that he was only slightly wounded. He, in turn, screamed and asked again what did he say. Mr. Minoru asked what he was going to do with it. Amami replied that he planned to take it with them and examine it a little later. They looked at each other. Mr. Minoru said that he did not understand this. He asked again whose side is he on. He cannot believe that this man deserves to be saved. Amami, apologizing for his waywardness, timidly replied that he did not want to abandon those he could save. At this time, lunch was already prepared in the elf castle. In the room, Hake was lying on the bed. The elf queen held his wound with gauze. Hake said that he did not deserve such an honor, her majesty. To which the queen asked him to be patient. At the same moment, the princess came into the room and said that she had prepared a decoction from the leaves of the world tree. She hopes that it will help quickly cope with the pain. The next moment, Amami enters the room. He asked everyone for forgiveness. The guy said to put the wounded girl on the bed for now. The queen, looking at the girl, realized that this was the same sorceress girl who had run away from them. But Amami objected that now she was just a victim, and he asked to be allowed to use this place. He added that her condition should not worsen as long as she was not disturbed. He said that in the meantime he would take care of Hike's wound, since he was the priority now. Everyone surrounded the bed with Hake lying on it. At this time, Amami began examining his wound. He thought the cloth looked clean, but the wound had not been treated. He looked at the glass and realized that it was the aroma of the leaves of the world tree. He thought that taking painkillers without washing the wound was apparently the standard in this country. He asked the victim how his arm hurt, did it hurt? Hake replied that it was tolerable. Amami thought that it looked quite painful, so the leaf decoction was only effective to a certain extent. Amami turned to Corona, saying that he would like to clean his wound. A second later, the girl ran to her medical bag and took out a bottle of liquid. Amami began to clean the wound. His next action was to administer local anesthesia. The doctor said that he will now make several additional incisions. Everyone looked at the doctor in surprise. Mr. Minoru objected that the wound was already terrible, but he wanted to cut it even more it didn't sound very reasonable. Debridement is a surgical procedure in which the affected area is cleaned and dead tissue is removed to create an environment for the wound to heal properly. And dead tissue not only prevents the development of granulation tissue, but can also become a source of infection. Amami objected that after this, early healing would be much faster, and if left unattended, it could only get worse. But Mr. Minoru said that it would still make the wound even bigger. The princess turned to Commander Minar. She briefly showed the head wound that Amami had stitched up. She said that they had not yet come to an understanding of how Mr. Pene Amami's magic worked. But he should have already understood at least that this man was trying to help them. Koron supported the girl and said that it was so her owner was a wonderful person. The gentleman just lowered his head and sighed. He asked Amami to take care of his comrade. The doctor agreed. The next moment, Korain was already helping him put on medical gloves. Next he took out Metzenbaum scissors. He proceeded to make several incisions along the main wounds. Everyone watched what happened in horror. After some time, treatment of the wound was completed. Next, the doctor washed the wound again and smeared Vaseline around them. After finishing, Amami said that everything was fine now. He said that he would look after him until he gets better. Hake exhaled and said thank God. He, lying on the bed, said so this is the magic of Mr. Kiss and Amami. Getting to his feet, Amami approached the healer and said that he would now continue treating this girl. Amami asked Korain to give him a stethoscope. She immediately began to look for him. The princess asked can he still continue the treatment, to which the doctor replied yes. He said he would pick up where he left off. The gentleman asked himself a question the race and social status of the patients do not matter to him. So there are such people? Amami continued examining his patient. He said there was still air in the chest cavity, so he would insert a tube to release it and expand the lungs. If that doesn't work, he'll try a technique called pleuridzies. 
Chemical pleurisies is a procedure aimed at creating aseptic inflammation of the pleural layers with their subsequent obliteration by introducing various chemical agents into the pleural cavity, the most common of which are powdered talc, tetracycline derivatives and blevomycin. The queen called Uno. She asked what is it, to which the queen told her that she had made her decision. She suggested that the princess create a place in the world tree for Mr. M Mummy. At this time, Alec stood in front of the entrance to the prison cell. He said it was a special prison cell. You can't use magic in it, and you can't get out by force either. The healer looked at Alec with horror in his eyes. He shouted that he would regret it. A priest. You can't treat a person like that. He added that his mother was an exception to the rule, not amenable to treatment. He shouldn't be held responsible for not being able to help her. Baring his teeth, the healer said that now war could not be avoided. They'll make a fried lizard out of him, a piece of shit. Alec said he couldn't imagine anyone risking their life to save him. He left him alive because he realized that he did not even deserve to die. If this leads to war, so much the better. He will accept his challenge. His mother is already much better, so they will still see who is who. A second later, Alec struck the healer's face with all his might through the prison cage. He shouted loudly that he was the exception to the rules here, and he is the only one who regrets what happened. At this time, the healer was lying on the bed with her eyes closed. A gentleman entered the large hall where Archbishop Eccles was. He said that he had received a message about a priest and a deaconess going to the world tree. It appears that they abandoned their duties and were captured. The Dragon Queen Melina entered the building. She asked if she was in the way. The Queen and Princess of the Elves thanked her for the visit. The Elf Queen suggested that the meeting begin. At this time, the healer continued to lie on the bed. Thoracentesis chest drainage is a treatment method in which a chest tube is inserted into the chest cavity to continuously remove air, blood, and other fluids from the pleural cavity. The elven queen asked Melina returning to their agreement. Could she extend it? The queen replied that her condition had improved markedly, not to mention Alex. She asked for forgiveness and clarified did they really want this? The girl said that her recovery is the main thing now. Past conflicts will be forgotten over time. However, Melina had one suggestion. She announced the point, dragons are obliged to protect elves. She would like to add the name Uitiu to this point. The secretary added, and thereby prevent other countries from getting closer to him. The secretary asked that she wanted to protect him from them, but it can also lead to a situation where they have to make a choice between him and them. The Queen told Chancellor Maillard not to let worry overwhelm them. But it's scary to imagine what would have happened now if Princess Yuno had not brought him to them. One way or another, she wants him to stay here. This is not only for their sake, but also for his sake. The Elf Princess also spoke out that she was also in favor of Mr. Panamami staying with them. The Elf Queen asked the Princess that she was also saved by him, right? The Princess agreed. The Elf Queen would also like Mr. Pinel's Amami to remain in the hollow of their world tree, so she will not object to adding to the agreement. The Chancellor said that in that case, but she was interrupted and asked to wait. The Elf Queen said that she thought that first they needed to find out the opinion of Mr. Pinel Amami himself on this issue. Chancellor Maillard stood up from the table and said that she understood, and in that case she would call him. The treatment of the injured girl healer continued in the room. Corum, with a stethoscope in her ears, listened to the patient. She turned to her owner and said that sounds other than knock-knock were also heard on the right, coinciding with breathing. Amami, taking a stethoscope, decided to listen too. He agreed, saying that he could clearly hear breathing sounds on the right. Amami asked Corum to remember this sound well now she is recovering. But if this sound ceases to be distinguishable, then you will have to release the air again and again think about pleuratsis. The girl agreed. The next moment the healer opened her eyes. Amami noticed this and said that she had woken up. At that moment Alec was in the room. He looked at the girl angrily. Amami decided to defuse the situation and said that he was the one who found and saved her. He said that she would have to be patient for a while, 
but she was recovering so she could relax. The girl thanked him. Alec remembered his mother's words, think carefully before making a decision. The girl looked at the doctor and also thanked him. Amami turned to Alec and asked if he had any business with him. He turned around and said that no, he just thought that if he had a free minute, he would invite him for a drink. Already leaving the room, Alec heard Amami's apology, offering to do it next time. Corinne continued to look at the stethoscope in surprise. Amami asked her what is it? She asked in surprise that she could really use this amazing magical device, stethoscope. The ancient Greek healer Hippocrates introduced auscultation into medical practice, a method of listening to the patient's chest to assess the state of health. This method was used until the 19th century, until in 1916 the French physician René Linec used a long paper tube to listen to the patient's chest. Later, the American physician George Kamen invented the binaural stethoscope, which became the basis of the modern stethoscope. Amami said of course and moreover, he was just thinking of creating a stethoscope especially for her. She exclaimed with joy her own stethoscope. He said that, and the agreement with her grandfather is still valid. True, he only took with him one stethoscope. He suggested using it in turns. The girl agreed with this. She happily thanked Mr. Mithi Yuido. Amami realized that the problem was not only the lack of a spare stethoscope, he is missing a lot of things at the moment. It is necessary to create them as soon as possible. Suddenly they turned to Amami and asked if he was here. Chancellor Maillard entering the room said that she was acting as the court chancellor of Her Majesty Queen Melina. She looks forward to fruitful collaboration in the future. The next second, Amami attacked the girl with a question. Can he look at her glasses? Taking the glasses, he realized that they had lenses. He said it was cool. These are lenses. He raised his glasses up and said that with them their capabilities would increase. Koron asked what is another amazing tool. Amami said yes. Shedding a tear, the Chancellor tried to address Amami. At that moment, he returned the glasses to the girl and apologized, saying that he was too carried away. The girl began to put on her glasses and said that everything was fine. The main thing was that he returned them. Chancellor Maillard and Amami enter the meeting room. He approaches the girls and says that he just wanted to talk to them about something. He asked what he owed them. The Elf Queen asked what did he want to talk to them about. Feeling embarrassed, Amami said that he would be the first to speak then. This concerns the future of the victims. Their wounds and pneumothorax are no longer dangerous, but the risk of infection from wolf claws and fangs remains. He is especially worried about rabies. The elf princess asked again rabies. Amami explained that this is a life-threatening disease transmitted through the bites of dogs or wolves. Rabies is an infection transmitted through saliva through bites and scratches from dogs, cats, bats and other wild animals that carry the rabies virus. Rabies has not been found in Japan since 1957, but there have been cases of infection among people returning from abroad. This disease still requires attention due to its high mortality rate. The incubation period averages from one to three months, and if infection is suspected, it is necessary to get vaccinated during this period. Dragon Queen Melina said that didn't sound good. Amami said that rabies as he knows, it is not usually spread from person to person. He's not even sure if it even occurs here. Considering that representatives of various races have gathered in this kingdom, it would be useful to prepare for any development of events. The Chancellor asked what kind of preparation he was talking about. Alec, in the guise of a dragon, cut through the air with Amami sitting on him. They had a journey through the sky in search of materials to create a hospital. Alec asked Amami if he was cold. Amami replied that a little bit. He asked where they were going. Alec said Amami would warm up by the fire as soon as they got there. He'll see for himself now. The guys started flying past a small town. He said that, as he had said, their destination was the Tostium Mines. Amami said he sees a castle there. Alec clarified that this was a dwarven kingdom. More precisely, it was once. Leaning down sharply, Alec landed on the ground. Amami thought, was it? Are they all dead? Alec replied that they had moved to another place. Sort of. They are examining the new place of birth. Did Amami specify that they eventually flew there? 
Alec replied that of course, if we talk about spiritual silver then this is Tostium. Does he not understand why the dwarves abandoned him too? The guys went to the fireplace and started warming up. Sitting by the fireplace, they began to talk. Alec noticed that the old man seemed to be the last to leave the place. Did Amami clarify what Alec is saying about Norman? Alec confirmed that yes, his mother had told him so. I wonder what she left there. Amami said that this is what it is, the homeland of Norman. At this time, Norman was talking with the elf queen. He said that he knew that Amami was an outstanding person, but to carry something so grandiose. The queen said they were considering using this place. She admitted that they needed Norman. She asked if they could count on his support. Norman was surprised, as he needed. He remembered that his kingdom had come to an end. Norman leaned over to the queen and said that he owed them. He swore by hammer and anvil that he would live up to their expectations. Did he ask the girls what exactly they were going to build? The queen said that they just wanted to discuss this with a mommy. But the princess noticed that he was not there. The princess assumed that, apparently, she and Alec had gone to the Tostium mines to get spiritual silver. Norman asked in surprise, to Tostium. Spiritual silver. Everything is clear. He wants to create something using the dragon's mana. Norman told the girls that those lands are now nothing more than ruins full of dust. He added that they are unlikely to have any difficulties collecting spiritual silver, so they need to wait for their return. Meanwhile, they will do what they can. After a while, Norman found himself in the workshop. He gathered together the other inhabitants of the kingdom and told them that it was time to work. He demanded to show him the firmness of their character. Norman turned to a boy named Hugh and asked him to wait. At this time, one of the guys said that he would go to the quarry to drive wedges, and another decided to fill the boxes with soil from the black pond. Norman said he was counting on them. Hugh asked Norman what he wanted. The man asked the boy how his stomach was. Hugh leaned down and touched his stomach. He shouted that everything was in order in the morning. Norman reminded Hugh that firmness of character and stubbornness are not the same thing. He asked him not to overdo it. Hugh understood, but he also wants to be useful to his grandfather. But Norman corrected him, saying, to the master. Already starting to leave, Hugh asked the master to let him do everything in his power. He will collect the wood. The next moment, Hugh ran away. Hugh was carefully chopping down a tree with an axe. After cutting down the tree, he began to lift it. The man working with him told him to keep it up. He asked Hugh if his stomach hurt. How about a break? This only confused Hugh, but he respectfully said that, of course, he was glad. But they were all too worried about him. Hugging his stomach with his hands, Hugh said that sometimes it's just hard for him to go big. But the man objected to him, saying that by and large it should always be easy to walk. He asked, also with pain. That's what causes concern. But Hugh just laughed and said that everything was fine. But everything has changed dramatically. Hugh suddenly had a severe stomach ache. He immediately fell to the ground. The next moment, a boy ran up to Norman and called him. He told Norman that Hugh had fainted. Scared, Norman asked Nino where it happened. He demanded to be brought into him. Nino said the boy was in the castle. After a while, Norman found himself in the castle near the bed with the boy. He asked Hugh to hold on. The boy was sweating and writhing in pain. Norman shouted to Corona is there anything she can do? Was the girl embarrassed by herself? The princess immediately shouted her name. The princess asked Coron, shouldn't they bring a mommy first? But Norman said it would take two days to get to Tostium on horseback and two more on the way back. He asked, what should Hugh do? The boy continued to writhe in great pain, lying on the bed. The girls were very worried about him, but suddenly something scared them. Suddenly, the forest god appeared in the window. The princess timidly asked him, does he want to go after Mr. Amami? And at the same moment, the forest god agreed. The elf princess said she would show the forest god the way. Corona said, be kind. The girl began to go to the forest god. She thought about those people who were healers, but realized that she still couldn't rely on them. The dragon queen Melina came into the room. She turned to the princess and offered to put on warm clothes for her because she would catch a cold. The princess thanked the queen and said that she needed to find a mommy as soon as possible. The queen turned to Norman and said that she had come to find out where Alec had gone. But after seeing all this, she said she was very sorry. Norman was very angry. He replied to the queen that she and her children had nothing to apologize for. He's only angry because there's nothing he can do to help this guy. It's only noon, but no matter how much the princess and the forest god hurry, they won't make it before midnight. And the guy will be like that. Norman couldn't hold back his tears. Norman was worried that this would be another loss. If he loses someone else. At that moment, everyone around lowered their eyes to the floor. Coron thought about getting her master back as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Alec and Amami were approaching the hospital building. 
Amami said that they had managed to find an important medicine, ether. If they get hold of spiritual silver, will they be able to create tools and stuff? Alec thought about it. Then Amami asked the following question, this is the place. Of course, they still lack a lot, but he wants to start with what is possible. Alec said that it was better to contact Norman again about the building. He's a master at it. Amami asked, is it true? Cool. Alec added that he was strong and reliable. Although it's a bit noisy. The guys came to a low descent of the stairs. Alec said that this staircase leads to an underground tunnel. Amami stressed that it was a little dark there. It's even scary somehow. As Alec continued down the stairs, Amami grabbed the railing. With a voice trembling with fatigue, he said that the stairs were a bit long here. We have already passed 20 floors, if not more. Alec turned to Amami and told him to be patient until they got down. He will carry it back himself. Amami agreed. Suddenly Alec realized that they had already arrived. The guys stood in front of a huge tunnel. Rubbing his eyes, Amami said that how much space there was, and at least one ray of light. To this, Alec said, well, if that's the case. And in the next moment, everything around flashed with a bright light. Alec suddenly turned into a dragon and unleashed a huge column of fire. The fire spread throughout the tunnel. Standing in front of the tunnel, Alec said he couldn't see anything anyway. He hoped that at least something would light up and become brighter. But then Amami remembered and decided to get his diagnostic flashlight. But Amami wondered if it would be possible to check the oxygen level with a candle or a torch. He was interested in what they could be replaced with. But at that moment, something very sticky abruptly fell on him. The Velcro wrapped around his entire head so that he couldn't see anything. Alec was surprised and asked Amami not to move so that he could take it off. With his claws, the dragon was able to peel off the Velcro and free Amami. Amami thanked his savior. He asked, spiders. But in the next second, sticky threads began to descend from the ceiling onto them. Alec said that the last time he went through there without any problems, and now someone is wound up here. As he struggled with these threads, Alec realized that they were very annoying to him. He apologized to Amami and said it would take some time. In the castle of the kingdom, everyone surrounded the sick boy Hugh. But suddenly, a shadow appeared behind them and apologized to them. This is a healer. She asked to be allowed to treat this boy. Everyone was at a loss. Angered, Norman said that she had run away, abandoning Lindworn. He asked them not to even think about what they had forgotten. The man continued, how can he trust such a person? And if he does, if something happens, he will kill without the slightest hesitation. He asked her to step aside for her own good. But the girl continued, saying that even so, she apologizes for that incident to Mrs. Lindworn. She added that she didn't want to run away anymore, at least not until the man returned. Melina turned to Corona, asking what she thought of her words. What would Yuido do? Corrine replied that the owner certainly told the girl to help them. Melina thought she felt that way too. She turned to Norman, saying that even taking into account the events of the past, it is worth admitting that neither he nor she herself knows anything about healing. Paying attention to the girl, she said that a knowledgeable person is so eager to fight, so isn't it better to trust her than to continue to let his grandson suffer? Norman was grimacing with anger and hatred. He heard his grandson calling him. Writhing in pain, he said that he also asked the lady sorceress to look at him. Norman leaned over to his grandson and asked if he was in pain. He replied that yesterday it was the center of the abdomen, and today it's already on the bottom right. Koron noticed that the pain had shifted. Norman turned to the healer and asked her what her name was. She said her name was Saya. Pointing to the boy, he said that this was his grandson and his name was Hugh. He asked to be saved. At the same moment, the girl went to the boy. Saya walked over to Hugh and put her hand on his stomach. She spoke the words the sign of light in the well of mana. Corona asked, what does this mean? The girl said that the light sign indicates tension in the muscles. The mana well is a curse that causes pain, as well as swelling of the chest and abdomen. She noticed that her stomach was noticeably tense. The girl realized that, in such a situation, she would like to use the leaves of the world tree, which are said to stop pain. She asked if they could bring them to her. At the same moment, Koron, holding a decanter with a glass in her hands, was approaching the patient. She said they still had some decoction left. Noticing this, Melina said that it might not be enough. She'll go and cook some more. Saya thanked her. Koron brought a glass of decoction to Hugh's lips. The girl said she was starting. Memories appeared in the girl's head that Carnelson refused to help her. He said it was a hopeless case. The girl asked if he was sure. To which Carnelson replied that if you can't cure, you can't cure. In the next second, she remembered that Amami had said that it was his waywardness, but he did not want to abandon those who could be saved. Amami said they could relax. Saya thought that the man had not run away, but was fighting the disease and did not even ask for anything in return. 
She realized that she wanted to become as strong as he was. She's tired of losing something every time she runs away. In the next second, she began to pronounce the magic words. At that moment, in the tunnel, Alec and Amami were struggling with sticky cobwebs. Alec said he'd figure it out. He flew up and enveloped the entire space around him in fire. Lighting up the tunnel with light, he saw a spider sitting on the wall. At the same moment, he fired all over the wall. Running away, Amami shouted that he was hot. He was trying to stop Alec because someone unknown was saying something. Maybe they can talk to him. The dragon admitted that he had already pinned him down. Amami said that if he understood the speech, then he would like to talk to him first. Alec once again clucked and agreed with him, but asked him to be careful. The next second, Amami turned on his medical flashlight. He illuminated the space around him and saw that a girl with spider legs was lying in front of them. Amami was very surprised. He said it was a girl. Alec agreed with this, asking why she attacked them. At that moment, Slug Al was pointing with his little paws at what the girl was holding. She had a huge number of spiders in her hands. Amami apologized to the girl, as he saw that she was trembling all over. Alec asked him what he was apologizing for. He told him that she must have been scared by their sudden arrival in the fire. He realized that she was trying to protect the children behind her. Amami once again asked the girl for forgiveness. The girl was very surprised by this. In the next second, Alec turned back into a human. He chuckled again and also apologized to her, saying that it was impossible to make out right away in the dark. After a moment, the girl got to her feet and asked the guys, are they kidding like that? Do they suddenly kill someone when they lose their guard? Confused, Amami began to say, no, no, no. And Alec reminded her that they had apologized. The girl, in turn, reminded him that for no reason at all, he breathed fire on her. Alec told her that they had just met, and she was already being rude. Amami told the girl that they had come there for the so-called spiritual silver. The girl asked them again, in silver. The girl, showing a glowing piece in her hands, asked, for this. It's beautiful, so she took it for herself. Amami supported her, saying that it was beautiful. Alec confirmed that this was it. Guiding the hand with the silver to the Amami, she told them to take it, just so they wouldn't kill. Alec objected to her, saying that there should be more here, so let her take it for herself. Suddenly, because of the pain, the girl began to get down on one knee. There was a burn on her leg. Amami told the girl that it would not hurt to examine her leg and invited her to go with them. Not understanding his kindness, she asked him if he was a pervert. If she goes with them, won't they kill her? But Amami objected that that was not the point. It just seemed to him that she had a burn. Smiling, he told her that he would like to treat her if possible. He doesn't know if she'll agree. But the girl interrupted him by asking, to heal. Who is he? Amami. A moment later, the forest god appears in the tunnel with Princess Yuno sitting on it. At the same moment, Yuno said that it was good that she had found them. Raising his hands in surprise, Amami asked what they were doing there. But Spider Girl was very scared of such unexpected guests. Princess Yuno showed that Norman's grandson. At this time, the healer Saya continued to speak magic words. It was already very difficult for her to cope with it. Korain noticed that she was sweating profusely. She asked Saya if she was okay. But the queen realized that it was a lack of mana, she had gone too far. The queen told her that if she continued this folly, she would die. Saya was already sweating profusely, and the boy Hugh continued to writhe in pain. Nino asked, does it even work? Norman stopped him. Nino continued, telling the master that he never left Hugh's side for a second, and he never got better. Saya apologized to everyone, but said that cleansing magic is best suited for treating people whose stomachs have hardened due to the mana well. If only she could expel the evil spirits that are the cause of the disease. Nano began to frown with anger. After a moment, Seiya remembered about Amami's doctor. She apologized to everyone for making them worry. She added that she was fine. The healer continued to pronounce the magic words. A moment later, Queen Melina came up to her. She told her it would be bad if she fell and hit her head. Right now it's the only thing she can do for her. Seiya was very surprised by these words. Healerja continued her magical cleansing. At that moment, an increasingly loud sound was heard in the hollow. Everyone was surprised. Koron asked, is this the sound? Queen Melina told the healer that she had done well, that she had not given up and held on. She said help was already here. At this time, everyone who was in the tunnel suddenly flew in through the window. Amami thanked everyone for waiting. Korain has already approached her master with a medical suitcase. He asked her to forgive him for being so long. He's going to do the examination right now. At that moment, she said that she was starting to report information about the patient. Amami was very surprised. The girl said that this patient has a pronounced abdominal tension. 
The body is hot and trembling. She believes he is possessed by evil spirits. Amami asked again, by evil spirits. The queen explained that healer magicians often say that. They believe that with pus, indigestion and watery stools, the cause lies in the curse of evil spirits. And then the magic of purification comes in. Although she had never seen these spirits in her eyes, Alec, turning to Amami, told him that what cannot be seen with the eyes, doesn't it look like germs? Amami thought about it. Obsession with his spirits leads to suppuration and diarrhea. Indeed, bacteria and viruses fit this description. It turns out that the magic of purification. Healer Saya said that they belong to different races, but their body structure is essentially the same. She decided that when possessed by spirits, purification would be effective. Horon supported her, saying that she tried her best. But the girl admitted that she had not been able to expel them. Amami stopped her, asking her to wait a minute. He said it was very important, so he would like to clarify. Did he check with the healer that his body is arranged the same way as humans? The girl was surprised by this question. She replied that, not that she was sure about it. As a rule, such topics are prohibited. However, Bishop Eccles once said that this was the case. Amami admitted that he assumed that he and the dwarves had a similar body structure. He apologized to Saya and said that he needed to check something. He took a stethoscope and began listening to Hugh's stomach. He then proceeded to palpate the abdomen. Amami noticed that his stomach was hard. What did you think, muscle protection? He added that he was going to put a little pressure on his stomach. Muscle protection is a physical sign of tension of the abdominal wall muscles during palpation. Tension can be arbitrary and involuntary. Arbitrary tension associated with resistance and anxiety is not of great pathological importance. However, involuntary indicates the spread of inflammation of internal organs to the abdominal wall and is regarded as physical symptoms of peritonitis and other inflammatory processes. After Amami touched the patient's stomach, he cried out in pain. He apologized to Hugh, saying that this was the place. Corrine, deciding to help the doctor, told him that at the beginning the pain was somewhere in the middle of the abdomen, but now it hurts the most to the right of the navel. Amami realized that the pain point had moved from the epigastrium to the McBurney point. He realized that it was appendicitis. Norman asked the doctor what kind of appendicitis it was. The guy told him that this is a disease in which a place in the lower right side of the abdomen, called the appendix, swells. Appendicitis. Until the early 19th century, people usually used opium and brandy for pain relief and laxatives to treat appendicitis. As a result, the condition was often aggravated, and the mortality rate from appendicitis was about 60% making it a fatal disease. At that time, it was impossible to simply determine the cause, until in 1886, Professor Reginald Heber Fitz of Harvard University in the United States conducted a pathonatomical autopsy of almost 500 cases, concluding that the main cause of the pathology was the appendix. Since then, this disease has been called appendicitis. The McBurnia point is a painful point located on the border of the middle and outer third of the line connecting the right anterior upper iliac bone with the navel. Other known signs of appendicitis include symptoms of Rothsing, Rosenstein, and lumbar occlusion syndrome, but it is believed that these classic manifestations occur in fewer than 50% of patients. Norman asked the doctor if there was anything he could do about it. Hugh's suffering doesn't stop. He asked Saya, with this condition of the stomach, cleansing magic is usually used, right? She agreed with this and added that the bishop had also spoken about it. With such abdominal pain, it would be right to apply cleansing magic. He asked, does it usually help? The girl replied that yes, if the spirits are weak, then the effect is instantaneous. Alec chuckled, asking only if they were weak. What's the use of this magic? Amami realized that with a mild course, he uses this antibiotic remedy. Purification magic probably has the same effect. An antibiotic. If peritonitis or severe abdominal symptoms occur, only one conservative treatment cannot be performed and surgical intervention is required. However, according to available data, the appointment of antibacterial therapy for mild appendicitis in about 8 minus 90% of cases gives a positive trend within two days. Although there are some cases requiring surgical intervention at a later date, the feasibility of initial conservative antibiotic treatment is currently being established. Ja asked again, is the medicine with the same power as purification magic? Corain asked, is this not the kind of thing that the owner used to kill germs? Amami replied to her that you can say it cleanses. Melina clarified with the doctor that they still have similar methods. Norman said, then why don't they continue the cleansing until they are completely cured in combination with the medicine? Amami wondered what to do. I can rely on the remaining antibiotic and the healer's reserve of strength, but it's a pain. 
There is also a risk of recurrence. Amami asked Alec if he could invite Shea here. He wants to use the ether. The next second, Alec transforms into a dragon and flies out of the hollow to call her. Melina asked the doctor how he was going to use ether. Amami replied to her, in Lin's case, he penetrated inside the body and dried up the tumor. But now this is impossible. It remains only to cut out the problematic part from the outside. Norman grimaced should he cut his stomach. Amami explained that thanks to the ether, he will fall into a deep sleep and will not feel pain. He is afraid that otherwise the treatment will not be carried out. With a displeased face, Nino asked the ether master, isn't this the dangerous medicine after which you behave strangely and fall asleep at the end? A second later, Shea appeared in the hollow. Alec said he brought her. Norman looked at the girl with displeasure. He told Amami that he remembers with what interest he talked about it when visiting this succubus girl. It seems to be completely anesthetized. He said he was needed for the hospital, but he also said that he needed to be tested properly. In other words, ether can be dangerous, and it is unclear whether it is effective for pain relief. Norman knows what happens to those who continue to inhale it. He said it bluntly, he's afraid of the ether. Besides, if he wasn't sure if it relieved pain, he definitely wouldn't want to use it on Hugh. He added that this is why he wants to apologize to him, but that he was rude. Norman turned to Shea and asked her to test the ether on him. With tears in his eyes, he said that his life was in their hands. He asked to save Hugh. Everyone was looking at Norman with pitying eyes. Norman went to the bed and sat down in front of his grandson. Shea came up to the man with a suitcase. The next moment, Norman was already inhaling ether. Inhalation anesthesia is a method of general anesthesia based on the use of gaseous or volatile general anesthetics entering the patient's body through the respiratory tract. The beginning of modern anesthesia was laid by a public experiment using ether anesthesia. That ether is currently outdated because it is explosive and cannot be used with an electrosurgical device. However, thanks to this, open up. The path to inhalation anesthesia was paved. Norman thanked Shea and handed her back the inhaler. A second later, Norman tore off a piece of his beard with all his fury. Looking at this, everyone in the surroundings was just horrified. Blood began to flow from Norman's torn beard. The man laughed and said he really didn't feel anything about it. And the next moment he fell unconscious on the bed. Shea, I went up to Norman and touched his finger. The man fell asleep soundly. She said, so be it. Going down the stairs, the merchant at the door of the castle was asked for his pass. The trader of the wounds showed his pass, to which he was told that everything was in order. The elf asked what had brought him to them. Ran replied that it was a job, of course. The man said that he could pass. The Ran merchant walked slowly along the stone road. At that time, preparations began in the room for the operation to remove the appendix of Hugh's boys. The following instruments were on the table, gauze, pus tray, cotton swab, povidone iodine disinfectant solution, scalpels, namely, peritonal, pointed, curved, needle with a medical syringe, medical syringe, chewy needle, surgical tape, absorbable thread, stapler, filter, catheter, cooper scissors, mayo scissors, piano clamps, tweezers with and without a wrench, flat hooks, retractor, connector. The queen, addressing a mommy, said that she would be waiting outside. She asked me to call her if I needed her. Amami respectfully thanked her for her concern. Alec turned to Amami and asked him if there was a tray that was free of germs. Amami picked up the tray and handed it to Alec. Alec picked up the spiritual silver and immediately used the power of fire, turning this piece of spiritual silver into three sharp scalpels. Scalpels magically appeared in the tray. Sterilization by fire. As the name implies, it is a method of destroying microorganisms under the influence of high temperatures. Products made of non-flammable materials, glass, porcelain, metals, should be heated in the flame of a Bunsen burner or an alcohol lamp for at least 20 seconds. Alex said he could do three things so far. It guarantees sharpness. And with such a fire, you don't have to worry about germs, right? Amami thanked Alec in surprise. He said he would stay outside too. With surprise and gallows, the healer Saya thought that he was really going to treat the patient by cutting his stomach. Even if the pain can be suppressed, how can it help? What this young man is going to do is undoubtedly taboo for any of them. Who is he? Concerned residents, sitting right on the ground, were waiting for the end of the operation on the street. Shea, approaching the bed with the boy Hugh lying on it, said that he seemed to have been suffering for a long time. She asked if she should give him a drag, but a mommy said she needed to wait a bit. He just has a couple of disposable robes. He said they all need to put them on. After putting medical gowns and hats on the girls, Amami asked if he could be heard. Koron replied that she could hear him. Amami said that he knows that the cap and robe are tight, 
but since they are dealing with germs. He told Shea that she had horns, so he asked her to do so, and tied her head with a handkerchief. Wearing a sterile mask, Amami began the operation. He said that in addition to inhalation anesthesia, he would need another type of anesthesia, so he needed to prepare it in advance. This must be done while Hugh is conscious. He apologized to the boys and said it would hurt him a little. Amami asked Corinne to put her hands in the same places as Amami's and hold the boy in this position. Coron agreed. The girl sat down next to Hugh, who was lying on the edge of the bed, and took hold of him in the places indicated by Amami. The doctor approached the boy from the back and said that he would touch his spine. With his fingers, he could feel the protrusion of the iliac crest, as well as the Jacobi line. Amami realized that he could use a marker right now. He apologized to the boy once again, saying that it would hurt a little. Amami pressed the boy's back so that he left a small nail mark. At this time, Hugh began to writhe and contract violently in pain. Amami thought that, probably, if you put it along the Jacobi line, then there should be no nerve damage with spinal subarachnoid anesthesia. It is also necessary to take into account the condition of the lumbar vertebra and the fatness of the patient. He hoped that everything would go well. The Jacobi line is the line connecting the highest points of the left and right iliac crest. The intersection of this line and the spine corresponds to the position between the spinous processes of the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae. The probability of spinal cord injury when a needle is inserted into this area is considered low, which allows spinal anesthesia to be performed relatively safely. However, due to obesity, pregnancy, thickness of subcutaneous fat or curvature of the lumbar spine, this line may pass at the level of the third lumbar vertebra. Amami turned to Yuno and told her to have this pot standing here, pointing at it with his finger. He asked to pour a disinfectant povidone iodine into it. The girl immediately brought a bottle with the necessary contents. She poured the solution into a pot, which already contained cotton swabs prepared by Amami. Amami thanked the girl for her help. The doctor took a syringe with lidocaine and said that local anesthesia was needed first. Amami apologized to Hugh once again and told the boy that he would be burned. The doctor put the injection in the chosen place, from which Hugh began to twitch in pain. Amami apologized to him again. The doctor took Chuoi's needle from the medical table. He told Hugh to let him know if he felt any numbness or pain in his limbs. He said there would be a little pressure on his back now. Amami slowly began to insert Chuoi's needle into Hugh's back. Amami crossed the interosseous ligaments and thought that he had very little left. He needs to be a little more careful. Spinal subarachnoid anesthesia is a method of anesthesia in which a local anesthetic, such as bupivacaine, is injected into the subarachnoid space of the spinal cord, also known as lumbar or spinal anesthesia. Her ectory is more than 100 years old. In 1898, German surgeon August Beer performed the first spinal anesthesia using cocaine, and two years later Adajiro Kitagawa performed the first. In Japan, spinal anesthesia using morphine. While administering anesthesia, Amami wondered if that would be enough. He slowly began to remove the needle from Hugh's back. After the doctor pulled out the needle, something started dripping from the syringe. Amami realized that it was cerebrospinal fluid. The doctor exhaled and closed the syringe valve. Amami said he was taking a catheter. From a sterile bag, the doctor takes out a catheter and inserts it into a syringe inserted into Hugh's back. As he guided the catheter deeper, the doctor realized that the catheter had passed about 15 centimeters. Next, he deleted the Iglochuoi game. After looking at the catheter, Amami said that the cerebrospinal fluid was coming out normally. And now he puts on a filter with a connector to attach it to the remaining end. Amami fixes the catheter on his back with a surgical tape. The guy turned to Shea, telling her to be kind. The girl asked, is it time? Should she put him down? Amami agreed, saying that he should fall asleep so soundly that he would not wake up from the pain. Shea said it could be dangerous to go that far. Amami replied to her, which is why he needs a person with her experience. She agreed with him. Next, Shea brought the inhaler to the boy's face. She told him that she had made a promise to his grandfather, and she hates breaking promises. So she told him to relax and get some sleep. A moment later Hugh was asleep. General anesthesia is an artificially induced loss of consciousness in order to help a patient without waking up even in the presence of a painful stimulus. The main components of general anesthesia are analgesic, that is, pain relief, sedation, that is, loss of consciousness, and muscle relaxation, which prevent tension during treatment. Amami said that everything was fine. He turned to Shea, saying that he was counting on her until the operation was completed. Shea agreed. 
The next second, Amami said, well, he's going to have an appendectomy. Amami turned to Corona and asked her to give him the tools. He asked to attach the roundest blade with a rounded edge to the scalpel created by Alec. The girl handed the doctor a scalpel. Amami understood how to make an incision through the McBurney point along the folds of the skin about 5 centimeters. He held the scalpel to the skin. Everyone looked at the continuation of the operation with bated breath. Amami made a deep incision with a scalpel on Haya's skin. Amami recalled, 1 centimeter outside of the McBurney point and 4 centimeters inside. The girls watched the procedure without taking their eyes off. Amami asked Koron if she would serve gauze. The girl replied, of course. After holding the gauze on the cut area, he removed it and saw that there was no blood coming. The next step Amami took was a pair of tweezers with hooks. Tweezers are a surgical instrument used to hold objects instead of hands. There are two types of tweezers, with sharp hook-shaped protrusions at the ends and without them. Amami picked up the skin with tweezers and saw subcutaneous fat. Next, he recalled that he needed to dissect subcutaneous fat. It was thicker than expected. It's probably because he's a dwarf. He said it was good that Alex's scalpel was sharp. Amami exhaled, saying that one thing was done. Next, he took flat hooks. The muscle hook is a tool used to clearly visualize the surgical field through an incision. In particular, muscle hooks are used in open abdominal surgery to hold subcutaneous tissue and muscle layer. Using flat hooks, he grabbed the opposite edges of the skin and saw the superficial fascia of the abdomen. Amami turned to Corona, suggesting that she try to expand the operating field with this tool herself. Koron timidly agreed. He reassured her, saying that everything was fine, and asked her not to be nervous. Next, he picked up the curved blade and the tweezers with hooks again. Amami began to make a small incision, going deeper inside. Koron was sweating profusely from the experience. The aponeurosis of the external oblique abdominal muscle was next visible. Amami said that everything was fine, then it was necessary to work with a pointed blade. Koron asked the owner that they had cut quite deep, and the bad place was even further away. He said yes, there is also an internal oblique muscle and a peritoneum. It is even lower, a swollen appendix. Amami made another incision, a poneurosis of the external oblique muscle, gradually, along the fibers. Next, Amami took a Veitlaner expander. It works not only horizontally, but also vertically. And also from that moment on, he took the Mayo scissors. Amami inserted an expander along the edges of the cutoff area. Amami saw the internal oblique muscle he was just talking about. With fear in her eyes, Corrine asked, is the appendix about to show? Amami said yes. Next, he used a pin clamp. He turned to the crown, asking them to put the hooks back in place, which he had just expanded. The girl agreed and did it. Amami saw the fascia, the semilunar line, and the transverse abdominal muscle. Amami continued to make an incision in his abdomen. When he got deeper, he saw the peritoneum. There's still a little bit left. He told Corona that she could rest for a while, and Amami would put on a retractor. The girl walked a little away from the surgery site, she was sweating profusely. The princess offered to wipe her sweat, for which Corrine thanked her. The princess wished her luck, and Corona nodded to her. Next, Amami took tweezers without hooks and invited Corona to continue. He asked her to hook these tweezers so that he could make an incision in the center. The girl tried to do it and asked the doctor, like this. To which Amami said that, yes, and thanked her. The girl clamped the peritoneum on both sides, and between them. He made another incision. He thought that the Kikum would soon appear, from here again with scissors. Suddenly, a huge ball appeared from the cut section. Everyone looked at him in surprise. Meanwhile, residents stood outside and waited for the operation to be completed. Nino was very nervous and worried about his friend. Catching up with Alec, he asked him to wait. Frowning, Nino said that the master seemed to trust Amami. He repeated Amami's words that his stomach hurts and therefore it needs to be cut to heal. Nino doesn't believe him one iota. He said it didn't make any sense. Nino asked Alec, what was that scream just now? He rudely asked Alec to step aside. He wanted to check if Hugh was okay. But Alec said he wouldn't leave. He told Nino that he didn't want anyone else to repeat his mistake. He was talking about his mother, Queen Melina. He added that at such moments one can only believe and wait. Or is he wrong? Nino looked at Alec with pitying eyes. He sat down on the stone road and apologized to Alec for losing his temper. Alec realized that there was only one thing they could do. Believe in Amami. Koron asked Amami in a panic if everything was alright. He replied that yes, it was just that the abdominal pressure had increased a lot, so the intestine popped out. But Koron said it didn't really look like everything was okay. If there's anything she can do. And at the same moment, Amami asked her to hand Shea a yellow syringe from the table. 
There was lidocaine in the syringe. Corona handed Shea a yellow syringe. Amami asked Shea to connect the syringe to the filter attached to Hugh's back. Well, remove the lid. The girl did everything the doctor told him to do, and asked, like this, right. Done. Next, Amami asked her to put pressure on the back and inject the medicine completely. The girl agreed. Koron asked, what is it? Amami replied that it was called spinal anesthesia. There was another reason, besides the pain, why he had prepared Shea ether and another anesthetic beforehand. Removing his hands from the operated place, Amami said that it would take some time. Probably soon. Koron was very surprised to see how everything was pulled back in. Amami said that lidocaine, which is commonly used as an analgesic, has a muscle relaxant effect when administered subarachnoid. In other words, this relaxes the abdominal muscles and the intestines do not come out. Spinal anesthesia has a faster initial effect and a stronger muscle relaxant effect compared to other methods of anesthesia administration, since it acts directly on the nerve zone of the spinal cord. However, it has a side effect in the form of lowering blood pressure, and the duration of the effect is short, since it is usually limited to one injection. Corona realized that this was the medicine that was used in the treatment of the forest god. It's free for that. Cool. The girl thought that such an inexperienced deaconess as she was able to understand that under the influence of this man's magic, the world would change so much that it would simply not be recognized. Amami said that he has not only pros, but also cons. This anesthetic lowers blood pressure, which can be dangerous. Lidocaine has a limited duration of action. They need to hurry up. Continuing the operation, Amami said that it was a loose band of the colon. If they go along it, the colon is the final part of the digestive tract, the total length of which is about 1.5 meters. It consists of the cecum, colon and rectum. Amami continued, if the structure of the intestine is the same as that of a human, then there should be one behind the tape. And the next moment they saw an inflamed appendix. Appendix. The cecum and appendix are often confused, but in reality the cecum is the beginning of the colon. The appendix is a process protruding from the posterior epidial wall of the cecum. The appendix is also called a vermiform appendix, the length, shapes and positions of which are individual for each person. In the case of inflammation of the appendix, there are two types of treatment, surgical removal and drug treatment with antibiotics. Koron saw a protruding appendage and asked, is this an appendix? Amami said that yes, he is the cause of the inflammation, so they should cut him out, although the tissues around are not so inflamed. Koron asked what it meant. Amami replied to her that yes, it was possible. The princess thought that it was all thanks to Seiya's cleansing magic. Amami supported her, saying that he also thinks that it was she who stopped the inflammation process. Picking up the surgical clamp, he thanked Seiya. Seiya was touched by these words, she was useful. She replied to Amami that she was glad to help. Amami wondered, magic, and yet how does it work? But he will study it later, but for now something else is more important. He thought that if he cut the appendix in this way, it would start bleeding. At this time, he called Princess Yuno to come to him. He asked her to hold the forceps for him. The girl obeyed and picked them up. Meanwhile, Amami took a medical thread. He began to run the thread through the process, tying small knots. He thought that if he overstretched the thread, he could cut the artery and then the bleeding would begin. However, if not bandaged tightly enough, it will lead to the same result. We need to act very carefully. Amami caught the thread between his fingers. Next, he bandaged a large vessel of the process. Next, he took Mayo's scissors and cut the thread. Amami held the scissors to the artery. Everyone froze in anticipation. Next, Amami abruptly cut off a large vessel of the appendix. Koron noticed that there didn't seem to be any bleeding. They did a good job, Princess Yuno noted. Amami thanked Yuno for his help. She said she was happy to try. Amami suggested that we continue. They finally proceed to remove the appendix itself. But first it was necessary to bandage the base. Otherwise, there will be a hole. Amami took the pin clamp. He pinched the base with forceps. Koron watched his actions with curiosity and fear in her eyes. Amami let go of the forceps, and a trace was visible in their place. Then he grabbed a little lower. Then Amami took a thread with a needle and brought it to the appendix. The doctor began to sew up the base of the process with careful movements. He needs five more stitches. After a while, he was done with it. Amami asked Yuno to intercept his left hand. The girl obeyed and began to perform with hands trembling with fear. Amami calmed her down and asked her not to be afraid, because everything is fine. The girl intercepted the doctor's left hand. He supported her, saying that everything was fine and she was doing great. He asked her to keep it that way. 
Amami Snov took a thread with a needle and continued to sew the necessary place. After making a few stitches, he needed to tighten the thread well. The girls watched this process closely. Amami did it all right. It's time to remove the appendix. Amami took a scalpel with a sharp blade. All the girls had fear in their eyes. Amami slowly brought the scalpel to his appendix. Then, with a sharp movement of his hand, he cut off the appendage. He shouted, cut it off. The doctor put it aside on the medical tray. Next, he disinfects the cut site with a cotton swab soaked in povidone iodine. Amami asked Yuno to hold the thread. The girl took up the thread, and Amami cut it with scissors. He thanked Yuno, saying that everything was fine now. She said it was good. Amami said that next he needed to tuck in the remaining tissues with tweezers. He carefully grabbed the tissues that remained after the incision and carefully tucked them into the hole. Then he needs to tighten with a prepared thread. He tightened the thread and the hole closed, this is called a pouch seam. Amami made a small knot and cut off the remaining thread. The guy told the girls that they had successfully removed the appendix. Koron praised Amami saying that he had done a good job. Amami thanked her in return, saying that she did too. Now you can relax a little. He thanked her for her help. However, the operation is not over yet. Now it is necessary to carefully sew up the stomach. There's still a little bit left, they need to push up. Corona said yes, master. At this time, Norman began to be woken up. He began to slowly wake up from a sound sleep. All the residents stood in the hope of good news. Shea appeared from behind the door. She apologized for making them wait. Nino ran to Shea with a question. What's wrong with you? Amami, Norman, and Shea stood in front of them. Alex shouted, Amami. Nino shouted, Master. Norman, with tears in his eyes, said that Hugh was safe. He's sleeping peacefully now. And all the residents began to shout loudly and joyfully. Healer Shea stood with her eyes wide open and looked at the others. She thought that this man had dealt with such dangerous evil spirits. Someday she'll. Shea continued to stare at Amami in surprise. Norman made remarks to Nino and asked him to be quiet. He would wake Hugh up. Norman turned his attention to Amami. He apologized to him for calling him a youngster. He will never forget his kindness. He added that from now on he would rely on him. Amami said it's mutual. At this point, the operation to remove the appendix can be considered completed. And everyone offered to drink to the success in building the hospital. Everyone was sitting in a large circle, holding up their mugs. Everyone drank to Hugh's speedy recovery. Raising the mugs up, everyone shouted, let's shudder. Healer Shea, dressed in clothes donated by Shea, stood in front of Hugh and performed a magical cleansing. Corain said it was a good job, but Shea said it wasn't worth it. She's doing her best. Koron asked her not to be modest. The owner is also very pleased with her. It was thanks to her magic that the inflammation was stopped. Saya smiled sheepishly. Norman stood in front of Hugh and asked him how his stomach was. Sho told him that he felt great. The pain is completely gone. Norman thanked everyone. He couldn't have helped Hugh on his own. He thanked not only Dr. Amami, but all of them. He is wholeheartedly grateful to them. Princess Yuno said they were happy to help. At that moment, Alec came into the room. He asked if Amami was there. Alec walked further into the room and saw Norman. He said he was here too. He asked if they were celebrating. Norman told him that he was not up to alcohol. He's worried that something might happen to Hugh. He said he would build a great hospital for Dr. Amami first. Which one has never been seen in this world. We can have a good drink. Alec smiled. The next second, Norman asked Alec what he was asking about the doctor. He sent him to rest. He said that even for the sake of his grandson, but after the operation, Amami went back to work with his head. Koron supported Norman and thanked him for making him go home. Otherwise, he could barely stand on his feet. Norman tried to send Amami home by picking him up and telling him he had to go to bed. Alec clarified, was he barely standing? Alec entered Amami's room. He felt an unpleasant smell. When he saw Amami, he said, what a stink. He said it again. Alec picked him up and sent him to bed. Amami said he wanted to work on the soap some more. But Alec asked him if he had recently fallen off his feet. He demanded that he fall asleep. Alec said that there are things that only he can do, but that doesn't mean he has to take the rap for everyone now. He asked if he didn't trust them that much. He asked me to rely on him and the others. Amami apologized to Alec for making him worry. He thought he was panicking. Amami asked him again, panicked. He said that during Hugh's treatment, he thought was it really appendicitis. He was not completely sure that the treatment would be suitable for him. His knowledge is meant for the world he came from. Although their worlds are very similar, in reality it is necessary to double-check everything. That's why he has to do his best. He added that if the current success is due to simple luck, then they cannot be sure that everything will be fine in the future. What if something goes wrong next time? 
Alec looked at Imami. He said that he didn't care. He continued, if he doesn't cure, then no one will cure. Therefore, if he fails, Alec will not regret it, nor will he hold a grudge against him. He asked me not to worry about it so much. After all, he worries about him. Amami thanked him for those words. At this time, the trader ran knocked on the door. Someone asked him from behind the door, who is there? He replied, a man. The door opened, and from behind the door he was told, welcome, Mr. Lan. Lan asked, what's the news? The man replied that after the recent hype, unflattering reviews about them were heard everywhere. However, he doesn't think it will be a problem for them. He's here to get this information. The merchant asked him to get down to business. He asked, what about the leak of healing magic? The man replied that he thought they had a different problem now. According to rumors, Carlson was left alone and not even touched. The merchant asked, were they left alone? A healer magician. But why? But in response, he heard, be sure to wash your hands before eating. Drink boiled water. When coughing, it is necessary. The merchant interrupted him, asking what else is this? He was told that according to the queen, it should replace healing magic. The merchant asked, to replace. How absurd. The man said that this country is on the verge of change. Soon they won't need healing magic. Spider Girl handed Amami a robe with the words, Rome did it. Amami was surprised to tell her that it was amazing. Koron also supported him, saying that she looked just like the clothes that the owner always wore. The girl said that her leg doesn't hurt anymore. It's warm here and the food is delicious. Amami was delighted, so the steroid ointment worked. Wonderful. The girl said that Rome and the spiderlings want to stay here. They will make even more clothes. Embarrassed, the girl asked, Can I? Amami asked Yudo. She replied that, of course, they would give her a warm welcome in the hollow of the world tree. She will tell the queen the news. The girl jumped up with happiness and shouted, Hore. At that moment, Alec came into the room and asked, What is that noise? When she saw him, Rome was very scared. She hid behind Amami and said, The dragon is scary. But Alec said, addressing Amami, that it was already time for an open lecture. Many inhabitants of the World Tree were moving along the wide road. On the square, the elf girls were shouting, for an open lecture by the wizard Amami, which starts now. There were guards on the aisle. They asked to check the bags of the girls. You can make sure that there is nothing dangerous in them. The guy said there were a lot of people here. He wishes there was a wadget here. He asked the girl, did you come empty-handed? Then come on in. One of the guards asked, are these the guys who can look through objects? The guy told him that they could look right through the bags. The guard replied that he had not seen any in the world tree. He asked me to stop complaining and just check everything carefully. The guy told him that it would be bad if something happened today. After all, they were visited by neighbors from the land of night. Seeing the girl in the mask, Koron asked, diplomats. Yuno answered her yes. She's talking about the vampires who arrived yesterday. They got interested when they talked about an open lecture, so she invited them. Healer Saya asked, are they even going to tell foreigners about their healing magic? Amami said that they would be left without a penny. Corona said he couldn't hear them. She asked if it was worth sharing knowledge with them. Alex said that of course it was worth it. He said that an open lecture would be held in order to pass on knowledge to others. Amami wants to spread them as far as possible. He added that if Amami's words would save people's lives in difficult times, then he sees nothing wrong with that. Saya said he was right. Barely standing on his feet and carrying a heavy table, Amami said he was ready. Amami and Koron stood in the middle of the square. He wished everyone a good day and thanked them for coming. Today, he would like them to find out more about bacteria. Amami asked Hugh if he remembered what a bacterium was. Hugh raised his hand and shouted that his stomach hurt because of them. They are evil guys, and they are so small that it is impossible to even see them. Amami happily said that it was. He answered correctly. He asked Norman to create tools that would allow them to see them. Norman raised his hand and shouted, yes. He asked me to leave them to him. Nino asked if they couldn't see them, then how would they deal with them? Amami said it was a good question. He asked me to take a look at the following first. He showed everyone a test tube half filled with soup. Amami said that this is a meat soup that he made a few days ago for the sake of this experiment. Nino said he looked and smelled terrible. Amami confirmed, saying that this was due to the fact that many bacteria had made their way into it, which multiplied greatly. They can see their influence now, right? Nino replied that it was true, his stomach starts to hurt when you eat something old. Is this also the bacteria's fault? 
Amami replied in the affirmative. Now he asked to look at the table. He said it was that strange glass thing that the master had made. Nino shouted out. But this meat soup looks absolutely normal, it can't be. Amami replied that yes, it is a meat soup cooked at the same time, but placed in a flask with a swan's neck, which is difficult for bacteria to get into. A flask with a swan's neck, the neck of this flask is thin, long and curved. Robert Koch, along with Louis Pasteur, the famous father of bacteriology, used this flask in experiments to refute the theory of spontaneous generation. The soup, cooked in a flask, showed remarkable resistance to spoilage due to the limited airflow and a long and thin pipe, which makes it difficult for bacteria to pass inside. Amami said that there are no bacteria in the soup because they can't get into the flask. Nino asked him, but they don't have these swan-necked flasks. Amami replied that the flask is not the only way to preserve the shelf life of the product. They can store it at low temperatures or fill it with water containing salt, or store in an airtight space. There are many ways to limit the amount of bacteria in food. Eating a piece of meat, Norman realized that this is why salted meat lasts so long. Amami continued, there are bacteria around everyone that they can't see. Now they have to understand that they will breed everywhere only if they don't take action. Amami asked the audience, so what can they do to stop excess bacteria from entering their bodies? Also eating a piece of meat, Hugh asked is he talking about washing his hands. Amami was happy to say exactly that. That's what he wanted to hear. To reduce the number of bacteria as much as possible, they should wash their hands. Everyone was looking at Amami with interest. There were many races living in the hollow of the world tree, including those who did not have hands. That's why Amami said, hands are what they take food with. Norman shouted, it's clear. With water, right. He said he would do so next time. Now it will keep the disease at bay. Now they understand everything. The residents thanked the doctor. Everyone started applauding him for such a performance. At that time, diplomats also watched his speech. She told the girls in the mask what an interesting man. The man asked, are they sure they can let him do as he pleases? Another guy approached him, calling him by the name of Koska. He continued, they humans stand above other races because of their monopoly on healing magic. The guy told him that he thought it would cause a disaster like never before. They must report to the church immediately. To the church of Archbishop Eccles. At that time, on a small street, a girl was playing with a ball, kicking it off the wall. Suddenly, she noticed that the stones began to fall right on top of her. At the same moment, someone appeared and came to her rescue. B, catching the girl right out from under the rocks, said it was close. She saved a little girl from danger. The girl thanked her. Fee said it was dangerous and she had better be careful. She shouted to the men standing next to her that they could keep an eye on her, damn it. She asked the girl not to stray far from those looking after her. She asked, where are they? The girl led Fee to a small street. They approached the man, who immediately began to apologize. He said that as soon as he takes his eyes off Lena, she simply disappears. He thanked the girl who helped him. Fee asked if he was her father. The man replied to her that no, he was just a local man in the street. The girl noted that there were a lot of people there. She asked if something had happened. The man said that he just hadn't been there for a long time. A moment later, Lin ran in the other direction, saying, Brother March. The girl asked, March. Grinning, the man asked, What does she want? What was she doing in the slums? The man added that he owed a lot to Mr. Marsh. If she's looking for trouble, then he'll have to ask her to leave. But the girl, sticking out her tongue, said how could he say such a thing to a cutie? After all, she's just walking around here. At this moment, there was a crowd of people on a small street. One of them, addressing his brother Marsh, said that he had fallen and injured himself. He replied that it looked like a bad fall. The little boy, showing his leg, said that he was in a lot of pain. Marsh said he would heal everything now. He pointed his hand at him and began to chant a magic spell. Everything began to fill with light. Everyone watched the process in surprise. Marsh asked, how's it going? Does it hurt anymore? Immediately screaming with happiness, the boy said that everything was over. He was told that he was simply amazing. The guy told the boy to say thank you to Marsh. The boy thanked his brother Marsh. He, in turn, asked him not to disappear anymore. At this time, Agro said, God, use healing magic for the sake of a scratch. He apologized for disturbing him. They can't even pay him. Mr. Marsh told him not to worry about it. After all, he is not a healer from the church. He just does what he wants to do. Agro leaned over to him and said that they owed him a lot. From afar, it was heard that the food was ready. Marsh asked if something was wrong. Nothing, just this outsider. It doesn't matter. At that time, food was being actively cooked outside. They cooked among small wooden houses. Marsh was surprised. It's very nice and lively there. Agro said it was all thanks to him. But he remembered his words he's only doing what he can. 
The man with the scar said that especially the young guys. Suddenly, three guys stood in front of them. They brought him food and asked him to eat. Marsh was surprised, it was so unexpected for him. He said he would get in line with the others. Agro said that they began to feel indebted to him from the time he healed that disease. One of the guys offering the food remembered, the curse passed from person to person was so frightening. They are eternally grateful to him. They will never go to the red light district again. The guys asked to be allowed to thank him at least that way. Marsh smiled and looked down at his plate. He took a spoon and began to take the food. After tasting the contents of the plate, he said it was delicious. Agro was delighted, saying that he was glad to hear it. He is sure that Atna has put her whole soul into cooking. She wanted him to have at least some good food. Marsh thought she was fine. Recalling the girl with the burned face, Agro said that he had never seen anyone completely cured of the curse of the burned face. If it wasn't for him, it would have been bad for sure. Marsh indignantly replied that he was praising him too much. Any of the priests in the church would be able to cure this disease with purification. And he healed not only through his thought alone, but also through holy water. Urisiplas is a disease affecting the skin of the face or ears, usually caused by beta hemolytic streptococcus. Symptoms Pain, fever, skin turns bright red. Agro replied to him that maybe so, but they would not help them, the poor. They had never seen holy water before. Looking at Marsh's back, the man with the scar said, if there were six stars here, everything could have turned out differently. Did Marsh specify six stars? Agro began to explain to him, six stars that work directly for the great Archbishop Eccles. He had heard that some of them were wandering around healing the poor and unfortunate. Just like him, he added that, if true, they must be, they are very eccentric. He asked Marsh if he had met this Ackles when he attended church. But Marsh told him that they didn't know each other. We didn't even cross paths anywhere. Suddenly, unknown people appeared out of nowhere. They apologized to the residents for the sudden appearance. They were informed that they had come from the church after receiving a report of illegal and blasphemous treatment. There was a man in a hat standing at the top. He said he was the priest of Bern, and this is a decree in the name of God. He turned to the people of the slums and asked them to hand over this dirty underground doctor. At that moment, Marsh threw a black hood over himself. Agro said damn it, if he had known the bishop, he only hopes that the priest of their neighborhood will be able to do something. But the priest Byrne was persistent and shouted at the residents with all his anger, now, or do they dare to disobey God? At this time, all the residents looked at the priest with bewilderment and anger. After a second, Bayan's face changed and he began to smile. He asked, is that so? Very good. He and several other masked men went down to the residents and started looking at them. They came up to everyone and sniffed at people. Sniffing the residents, Byrne told them that they just stink. But this time, Atna was standing with her eyes wide open. She was afraid of what was going on there. A second later, her mom closed it when Byrne came up to them. But the masked men immediately took her by the throat and hands. They demanded not to get in the way of the priest and asked him to shut up. Atna tried to say a word, but her mouth was closed. Bayan approached her and began to sniff her. Mr. Marsh tried to stop the priest Byrne. He wanted to approach them, saying that if they were discovered by the church, it would not end well. But Marsha tried to stop Agro. He said he would be arrested and executed for illegal treatment. They'll manage somehow, but Marsh calmly asked him to let him go. He doesn't believe that everything will work out. At the same moment, Byrne, without lowering the girl, said, he feels it. Who is he smelling now? It's the smell of holy water. He shouted, they, the true researchers of God, will never treat these simple and rude people. And yet, he can smell the holy water on her face. He grabbed the girl by the throat and lifted her high off the ground. He shouted that the smell was proof. They won't fool him anymore. He demanded that the culprit be brought to him immediately, if they refuse. At this time, Fia was peeking out from behind the wall and watching everything that was happening. She asked, and what should they do now? But Bayan only shouted that this girl would be the first to be hanged for heresy. At that time, at Archbishop Eccles Church, Saul asked Fia if he should go too. But the girl asked the guy why he got attached to her. She asked him to do his job, to meet them above the comets. He said they were making a lot of noise. Slums and red light districts. Holy water, which was recently discussed, requires production facilities and human resources. But it is in that area that there is plenty of land and workers. But Comet asked, is this nonsense again? Holy water this, holy water that. That's all he cares about lately. But Saul, with a misunderstanding in his eyes, made a remark to the Comet. Saul said he was their archbishop. 
He asked me to stop making offensive remarks. Comet answered him, as he said. Fi asked the Comet, did he think of anything else? He replied to the girl that, yeah, right now the curse is gaining momentum in that area, especially among prostitutes. Knowing his strange tastes, he thought that sooner or later he would ask them to deal with it. Saul and Fi looked at the Comet. Saul said it was the first time he'd heard about it. He asked Comet if he knew much about prostitutes, but Comet asked not to make his slippers laugh. It's just that he doesn't know much about the world. Getting up from the bench, Fi said, well, she can't just sit there and say she's gone. She noticed that they must have been given tasks too, so let them get started. Saul shouted after her, hey, but Comet said he didn't care and let him leave her. Thinking about it, Comet said that he had no idea where he was sitting, chilling. What is their archbishop doing? At this time, on a small street, Byrne continued to drag Atna by the throat. But Fia got in his way. She asked him to hold his horses. She asked, what else is this about an illegal healer? She can't turn a blind eye to his behavior. It is not appropriate for a priest. In response to her words, the masked men cringed with anger. Byrne shouted at her what did she say? So she is that rogue healer. She asked him to wait. At the same moment, Berna threw Atna out with all his might and dropped her to the ground. Byrne turned to Fi and said it was wonderful. Madame Fi has six stars. Of course she wouldn't come to this dirty place for treatment, is he right? She replied to him, what if so? Is this a problem for him? Angry, Bayan replied no. Fi asked him if there was anything else. At that moment, Bayan had already started up the stairs and told her, nothing. He told those who came with him to leave. They quickly climbed the stairs and were no longer visible. Agro, turning to the girl, said that he could not even think that she was one of the six stars. This is the second time they've saved them. The girl admitted that she was very sorry. She asked them not to worry. Better. And in the next second, Marsh applied healing magic to Atna's wound. The girl said a big thank you to him. He asked her, the second misfortune of the day, right. He said that he would examine her mother next. Embarrassed, the woman asked, even her. He said she didn't need to be shy. Marsh started to approach the woman to help her, but Fia called out to him. She addressed him as Mr. Unlicensed. The girl suggested that Marsh take a little walk. She needs to discuss a couple of things with him. Atna and her mother began to worry a lot. Agro, standing up for Marsh, asked her to wait. But in the next second, Marsh held out his hand in front of him, indicating that he should calm down. He asked Agro not to worry. He said they could trust her. It's just a simple walk and guys should not neglect the invitations of girls. Everyone stood and watched Marsh and Fia leave. They stopped on the roof of a crumbling building. Fia said there was no one there, so they could start a conversation. She asked what his real purpose was. Did he put her here for any particular reason? Master Eccles. Marsh replied that the task assigned to him was his real goal, but his goal was also to talk to Fia like this, alone. The ears of the papacy will not reach them in this place. And what about the other goal? He wants to offer her another job. He added that the fish rots from the head. He asked to borrow her power. Of course, in troubled times like these, they are very polite. Usually their words reach him through other people or in writing. To which the girl said, is that how? And she apologized. At that time, there was a fight in a small building. The masked men shouted, this one of the six stars. They were fighting with each other. Byrne tried to calm them down. He said that after all, the real problem is the illegal wizard, who, God knows, will be there soon. If this is just a momentary whim of the six stars, then it will not be difficult to continue the plan. He shouted that of course it was the whim of these children. They just wanted attention and recognition for their charity. It won't last long. At that time, someone knocked on their door. He reported that Bascom Cheese had arrived. Bayan demanded to be let in. It was a man with a pipe in his mouth and a crown on his head. He apologized to Byrne, saying that he seemed to be busy. Priest Bayan said that his product is very effective. Sir Bascom asked how far that plan had progressed. That land, he must take possession of it. There is no better land to find. Marsh and Agro were walking down a long street. Agro said that this is a red light district. There aren't many people there. Agro replied to him that it was so terrible. Not so long ago, it was a busy town. Marsh asked why there were so many tents there. Agro replied that brothels are not popular nowadays. They have to work independently. The curse is to blame for everything. The whole area is turning into ruins. The owners of not only brothels, but also other establishments, like ordinary people, wanting to be near the curse, fled from there. If the curse is not stopped, this whole place will become useless to anyone. 
Agro asked Marsh why he came to the Red Light District. Did he ask if the sister of the six stars had told them something about the curse? He admitted that the purpose of his visit there was to cure as many people as possible to the best of his abilities. The girl from the six stars warned him about the relative situation, so Marsh apologized for asking for company. Agro said that anything is for him and he worries a little about his sister. The girl in the hat swung sharply at someone. Agro turned out to be in front of her. He said it was him. Nora said oh, it's you, brother. I asked her what it was. She surprises him. Nora replied that she was more surprised by his appearance at her sister's brothel. It's disgusting. She asked why he had come. Mr. Marsh appeared in the doorway. When Nora saw him, she asked, a client. She said, welcome to, scratching his head. Agro asked her if it was too late to pretend to be innocent. Smiling, Marsh said that he could see that he and his sister were getting along. Embarrassed, he asked that he had heard them bickering. But after a moment, Mr. Marsh began to stare at Nora. Perplexed, she asked, what? There were strange sores on her lips. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease caused by the bacterium Trepanema pallidum. It is transmitted through small wounds of the mucous membranes of the skin, mainly during sexual intercourse. In the early stages, rashes, hardenings, chankers and ulcers may occur in the affected area. Agro asked Nora to tell Marsh about the recent oddities. He came to find out that something was wrong there. He asked why she was holding a gun, but Marsh said he would cure her first. At the same moment, Marsh began to use purification magic. Mr. Marsh continued to perform the magic rite. The girl picked up a mirror and looked at her face. She saw that the swelling had gone away. Marsh said she probably didn't have any pain or itching, but if it had stayed that way, in the worst case, the curse could have developed and killed her. Nora was scared and asked, really, how scary? Mr. Marsh asked Nora how fast the curse was developing. Was it a red rash on her palms or feet? The girl said, showing her hand, that yes, she was there. It must have passed by now. She bent down slightly in front of Marsh and asked him to check on her. But Marsh apologized to her and said that Agro would have a stroke. He said, and something has changed since that day. Nora told me that men she hadn't seen before had come, definitely not from here. They spent several days here. The curse began to spread soon after. She admitted that she regretted it. She thought it was strange, but she didn't show it, so next time she tried to take them out. The same thing happened to other prostitutes. As a result, a rumor spread, the red light district would curse them. They're finished. Shrinking from anger, Agro said it was his fault. If only he had the money. Nora asked him if he had seen his face. When a fight happens, he always comes to the rescue. Closes someone with him and is injured. She knows that he works hard, so he doesn't have to apologize for anything. Besides, it's disgusting brother and sister licking each other's wounds. Agra walked up to the girl and hugged her. Marsh tried to defuse the situation and said that everything would be fine. He's going to do something about this mess. At that time, the Archbishop's church was entered, with the words, I report. And they put a stack of papers on the table. Fia was sitting on the chair. Arch said he understood now by contacting Fiai. It's just like she said. Recently, there have been reports of escaped slaves captured in the neighborhoods next to the slums. It's weird, if they were trying to hide somewhere, the slums would be the best place. Fia said there was a reason they didn't go to the slums. Arch said the fugitives did not reveal their identity. They are afraid that they will be sent back. A man who is on good terms with Ackles, the Bascom slaver, he should talk to him first. An excuse to check on him, curse people and even spread the curse all over the world. It's just disgusting. The man behind it all. What could be his purpose? Fa said that was his goal. She thinks that after going there, she guesses. Archie asked her if it was true. And what is it? The girl said that a new city in that area was approaching the slums like a tsunami. Against the background of its development, the construction in the slums is only puzzling. What if they decided to take over these lands on the cheap? Archie supplemented by weakening the slum dwellers by reducing their numbers, hiding it carefully. Their meanness knows no bounds. The girl remembered the words, go with Ark and catch the instigator. That was his order. Arch said that yes, after all, Mr. Ackles is currently absent. He will turn this matter over to Cardinal Sislarb. Arch quoted Fia, if we act, then starting from the day after tomorrow. He asked why she said that. She replied that the sooner the instigator was caught. But Arch interrupted her, saying that he thought so too. This was also included in the instructions of the master. Meanwhile, Bayan continued to talk to Basque. Byrne asked Bascom if this was the second time he had visited him today, did something happen? With tears in his eyes, Bascom answers him that yes, that's what happened. It's very bad. The day after tomorrow, the priest of the six stars will come with a check to thwart their plan. The head of the six stars, Archbishop Eccles, warned him. There is no greater mercenary to be found. 
No wonder he gave him the gold back then. Wild-eyed, Bayan asked, Ackles himself, so he's been on their side all this time, which was to be expected. Bascom continued that they could not stop the process inside the Papal Coria, but they managed to delay everything for two days. They have to find a way to deal with this by tomorrow. But one man, who was wearing a mask, turned to Mr. Byrne and told him that the six stars had made fools of them. He asked how about setting up a couple of suspicious deaths in the slums. Smiling, he said it was a great idea. Eliminate the inspector and hush up the check itself. But there is an even simpler way. With eyes full of madness, he said, since it's come to this, it's best to just throw everything into the flames, without leaving any evidence or witnesses. Burn everything. Inspection is meaningless in the absence of the subject of inspection. A true purification that surpassed all the magic of purification. They will purify this land with fire. Everyone was looking at Mr. Byrne. They began to praise him, shouting, Father Byrne. So to them, six stars. After all, he is the smartest. Indeed, if no evidence or witnesses are found, some suspicions may still remain. But this is a cheap and quick solution. Bayan turned to Bascom, saying that he had been so kind that he had been inspired. These cursed enemies, he was impressed by how quickly he burned them, preventing other people from infecting. Bascom thanked Byrne. They will not sell defective products and will not release them into the wild. That's their style. Then he will bring smelling water, suitable, among other things, for burning slaves. He said they should hurry up too. They must learn where and how to spread the fire. Tomorrow, they need to make sure everything is burned to the ground. 